Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. This is a battleship. And this is one of the main guns from that battleship. This is a 16 inch 50 caliber naval rifle, technically speaking. And yeah, absolutely enormous proportions here. Interrupted screw breech. The machining here from the late 1930s and this particular gun has been sitting outside for decades. Still amazing. The chamber, not rifled, going down. You can see the rifling down there. Yeah. This would send a 2,700 pound shell about 25 miles out, 20 miles with supreme accuracy. Amazing. Yes, that is indeed a battleship, and yes, that is indeed a gun of absolutely immense proportions. We will get back to the gun. However, that gun comes from this battleship. This is USS New Jersey. New Jersey is the second of a class of four battleships, collectively known as the Iowa class, after the class leader, USS Iowa. They were built for the United States Navy between 1940 and 1944. They were a class of four ships. Initially, they were planned to be a class of six. However, the two final editions of the Iowa class, Illinois and Kentucky, were never completed and eventually broken up on the slipway. However, the four Iowa class battleships that were completed, they all still survive today. They are the only class of World War II era US warships that survive complete and intact and all four Iowa class vessels are now operating as museum ships, of course, as is quite obviously the splendid USS New Jersey. From 30,000 feet, what are the Iowa class ships? Well, they are battleships. They were built for the explicit purpose when they were conceived of uh, engaging in World War II. Of course, the construction of the Iowa class was authorized before the outbreak of World War II. However, writing was very much on the wall at this point, and a global conflict was once again not too far over the horizon. New Jersey, as she sits here today, she has an overall length of 887 feet, 8 and 3 eighths inches. She has a waterline length of 859 feet 10 and 1 quarter inches and she has a beam of 108 feet 1 and 3 eighths inches. She has a displacement as built in 1942 when she was launched of about 45,000 tons and we'll get into why that 45,000 ton displacement figure was so and why it was so specific. As she sits here today, despite having been in service for nearly 50 years, as well as, of course, having seen numerous refits and modifications to answer the call of the needs of the United States Navy over that very long period of service, New Jersey still displaces about 45,000 tons as she sits on the Delaware River today at Camden, New Jersey. New Jersey is also the only of the four Iowa-class battleships to reside in her namesake state. USS Iowa herself is in the port of Los Angeles, California. Missouri is in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And Wisconsin, the final member of the four Iowa-class battleships, is at Norfolk, Virginia. Of course, Iowa, Missouri, and Wisconsin don't exactly have big port cities, especially ones on the ocean, to accommodate a vessel of such size. Therefore, New Jersey gets to be in her home state, and being from New Jersey, I have to say that it is pretty cool. Probably the only cool thing that we have in this state, that we have got a battleship named after us. So what I endeavor to do here is to take you along the way on the most recent tour that I have taken of USS New Jersey in August of 2023. At times, I will be supplementing this with photographs and videos taken in August 2023, as well as in my two previous visits to the battleship in 2019 and 2022. Every time that I have returned to the New Jersey, more sections of the ship are open, more equipment on board is operating, and more and more the ship feels like she's still alive, which is very interesting considering that the last time New Jersey was decommissioned was in 1990. So 
sitting here in 2023, the last time that this ship was operational under her own power was 33 years ago. So the fact that the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial, who now are the custodians and operators of the ship, are able to maintain it to such a high standard and to keep so many of the ship's own systems operational, it really is a testament to how dedicated those people are with the limited resources that they have, especially considering how much these ships would have cost to operate when they were commissioned. They are absolutely fantastic, and I do urge all of you, if you are in the New Jersey area, please go visit USS New Jersey, and even if you're not, please consider donating to these guys, because taking care of a vessel of this size, it's 887 feet long, it's 45,000 tons, it is almost exactly the same size as the Titanic. Right? So there's a very famous analog that is very close to the dimensions of an Iowa class battleship. So hopefully that illustrates the size of the challenge that presents anybody trying to preserve a vessel like this. And again, the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial do a fantastic job with their Iowa class battleship. So give them a look at on their website, link in the description. Also do give a subscription to their YouTube channel. Whether you're able to donate monetarily or not, exposure on their fantastic YouTube channel does generate revenue for the museum both directly and indirectly in terms of exposure and driving people to come see the battleship. So please give them some support because the history that they are preserving here is worth so much more than just the story of what this ship and others like it did during the Second World War. As I hope I'm going to be able to express to you, there is so much more to something like this than just big guns and stories of battles. However, returning to the vexing matter of that massive gun, well, just as it is one of the distinguishing features on a battleship, it is basically the first thing that presents you upon arriving pierside to Battleship New Jersey. Apart from seeing the profile of the ship herself, this massive gun is sitting there unceremoniously in the parking lot. This is one of the guns from New Jersey. It was taken off at some point. I believe it would have been taken off the ship at some point in the 1960s, late 1960s, most likely when they were refitting the ship for uh, service in Vietnam. However, it is now sitting here dockside in Camden and it's there for you to get up close and personal with because of course there are nine other barrels just like this on the ship itself. However, you can't exactly get close enough to touch them and you certainly can't look down the muzzle because they're all sealed up for preservation purposes. So this is actually a very interesting thing to take a look at and it is of course sitting there in the parking lot before you even get anywhere near to getting on the ship. And what of looking down the muzzle? Well, here you go. Obviously, a spider has decided to make his home in the muzzle of a 16-inch gun. However, this is what you see if you are on the wrong end of an Iowa-class battleship's main battery armament. Nomenclature for large naval guns like these is a little bit different to things that you may be more familiar with, especially if uh, you know anything about small arms. When we're talking about caliber here, we are not talking about the bore diameter. The bore diameter on this gun is 16 inches. So that's going to refer to, obviously, the bore diameter, how wide is the hole through the center of the barrel. Also, that's going to be overall the width of the projectiles that these guns would fire. We will also say, though, that these particular guns are 50 caliber. In small arms, caliber often refers to the bore diameter, and most commonly, caliber in small arms is expressed either in fractions of inches or in millimeters. For example, a 9x19 standard handgun cartridge nowadays, the 9 refers to the bore diameter in millimeters, 9 millimeters, and then the 19 is the overall case length with the projectile and cartridge as a single unit, 19 millimeters in that case. 50 caliber though for naval artillery this means that the overall length of this barrel is 50 times its bore diameter so you can do the math there we are 16 inches in diameter in terms of that bore and 16 times 50 means that the overall length of the barrel is 800 inches 
which if you divide that by 12, because 12 inches to one foot, you get an overall barrel length of 66.6 feet. This is about 16 feet longer than a standard US school bus. So just to put this into perspective how large these guns are, yes, it is something that is extremely impressive when you see it up close. And then you realize that New Jersey carries nine of them. You start to understand how you can lob a shell that can weigh as much as 2,700 pounds, well over 20 miles. And of course, as I said in the initial video segment here, you can see from this shot muzzle on the rifling that goes all the way down the barrel down to the chamber end where the projectile and powder would be loaded and rammed into the barrel before the breech would be closed. These are rifled, meaning that these are technically big rifles, the largest ever placed on an American warship, as a matter of fact. The whole idea in rifling a gun like this is just the same idea as rifling any sort of smaller gun. You want to impart a spin on the projectile so that it is stabilized in flight. The more stable your projectile is, and in this case stability is induced by the rotation and really gyroscopic precession, meaning it's going to want to resist being rotated by wind and other factors, the more accurate you're going to be. Even in small arms such as handguns that you may own or small rifles that you may own, you look down the barrel, after it's empty of course, you will see rifling down those barrels as well. This is exactly the same concept, just on an absolutely grand scale. Looking down the barrel from the other end, this is the breech end of the gun. Obviously there is no breech face here in terms of closing the breech and then being able to fire the gun, so this would not necessarily be visible when the gun is actually installed in one of those main battery turrets. However, you can see how the breech face will actually interface with the gun itself. All of this is obviously machined into the barrel itself. This sort of breech arrangement would have been called an interrupted screw breech. And the interruption comes from, you can see the wedges that are cut out in the sides here in this, not entirely sure what you would call this pattern, but there are three distinct wedges that are cut out from the circumference of this breech in this gun. And interspersed inside that area are screw threads which we will take a closer look at in just a few moments. But effectively what happens is you will have a breech face that swings in and then it will rotate. But because it's an interrupted screw, you don't have to turn this an entire rotation. And here are some of those threads in some more detail. You don't have to turn that breech in a full rotation to seal it. All you need to do is turn it through, looks like about 90 degrees, and you will lock in with those other tabs that are machined into the gun. So you will get a gas tight seal, meaning that you can safely fire that gun. The interrupted screw pattern, it uh, is the best compromise between getting a good gas seal and ease of reloading in terms of speed. Again, these guns could fire up to a 2,700 pound projectile and a full service charge would have been six powder bags of 110 pounds weight each. So 660 pounds of powder would be going off in that chamber and then pushing a 2,700 pound shell in the worst case scenario over 20 miles away. There's a lot of force that needs to be withstood by this breach and that interrupted screw scheme enables that to happen to great effect. And some more information about this particular gun. Obviously you can see here on the breach side, you have got U.S. Naval Gun Factory, 16-inch gun, Mark 7, number 292. And then uh, there's some more information about how much it weighs. Looks like 237,005 pounds, manufactured in 1942. You can see stamped there below the anchor in the bottom center. And also you can see the date 1969 that has been stamped in that plate as well. Here's a secondary plate, I believe, from 1969. This corroborates my hypothesis that this gun would have been removed from New Jersey during her 1967-1968 refit for Vietnam service because these guns, they weren't just thrown away and outright replaced when they uh, needed maintenance. They would 
reline them. So the rifling down the center of the barrel, that could be removed separately from the rest of the barrel. And it was a, a very involved process involving cranes and furnaces and all sorts of crazy maneuvering. But they would reline these guns basically to refresh the rifling so that uh, their accuracy would not suffer over time over continuous use. But that's the information about the barrel that is sitting in the parking lot outside USS New Jersey. And here briefly just referring to one of the models that I have of an Iowa-class battleship. This is actually showing Missouri in about 1945 configuration. So some of the things here will look a little bit different compared to what New Jersey looks like today. However, here I just want to highlight the configuration of the main battery armament, the large three-gun turrets that you can see in the forward part of the ship, as well as one that's a little bit out of sight on the fan tail. That is the main battery armament on an Iowa-class battleship. So there are nine of those 16-inch 50 caliber guns, and they comprise the primary means of defense, especially in the World War II era, for an Iowa-class battleship, and that is how they are configured. You have what are called super-firing turrets forward, and uh, the turrets are numbered one through three from four to aft. So the forwardmost turret is turret one, followed by turret two, which is one deck higher than turret one, so it's firing over the turret one gun house, hence super firing. And then turret number three is a little bit lower down on the vessel than turret two, but not quite as low down as turret one. So three turrets, identical in many ways, but each unique in other ways that we might get into a little bit later on. But that is the overall configuration for the main battery armament on an Iowa-class battleship. Nine of those guns that we've just been looking at. Now as you walk down the pier side, you go into the ticket office, you get your tickets, and they tell you by which time to be off of the ship. You start to take in the size of this vessel, and I've got to say, a sense of awe and grandeur starts to overtake you. Of course, the battleships, their explicit purpose is to lob a lot of lead over long distances at high velocities and be reasonably accurate while so doing. However, the other purpose of the battleship, and I don't think any other type of military vessel has been as good at this as a battleship is, their other purpose is just power projection and really diplomacy. If you want somebody to start paying attention to what you may have to say, you might park a battleship someplace off their coast. Quite honestly, after taking in the proportions of a vessel like New Jersey, if you're in command of a ship like this, I am quite inclined to listen to what you may have to tell me. And continuing to walk down the pier, the shock and awe parade continues. The closer you get, the smaller you feel, because this is a big ship. Those of you who have been on modern cruise ships, you have been on ships larger than an Iowa-class battleship. However, they don't quite have the same sort of imposing appearance, I would say. And again, the closer you get, the more you're looking up at the ship rather than looking across at it. And more fine details start to come into view and you start to appreciate just how complex an array of guns and radar and optical range finding equipment you're about to encounter. And then right up pier side, right up next to the hull, you also realize just how much of the ship, even unladed as she is, is still underwater. And that you'll be walking around through those areas soon enough. And then of course looking forward, there is the main gangway going to the quarter deck where you will actually board the ship, USS New Jersey, still proudly displayed there. And here this shot really highlights the glorious hull form that is an Iowa-class battleship. There is not a single straight piece anywhere along the profile of one of these vessels, and they are just something to behold. They are aesthetically so pleasing, in addition to having this complex shape for hydrodynamic purposes. They were the fastest battleships ever built by the United States Navy, and I believe the fastest battleships ever built by anybody, largely owing to this absolutely wonderful hull form. As you can see there, the curve of the shell plating along the bow. That is a wonderful shape. Now ascending the gangway towers, as it were, there are two towers on the pier. The uh, northern one is where you will board the ship from, and then there is one to the south here by a few hundred feet. There you will exit 
from when you are done with your tour, that is on the Fantail. However, you can now see you're now up on the level of the main deck and you can get a sense of how high above the water you are just on the main deck of the ship and zooming in on another angle of that absolutely glorious hull form on the bow of an Iowa. There is New Jersey's hull number 62, BB62 as she is officially known. That's where it comes from. New Jersey uh, here, she is painted in her last livery as she would have appeared in her 1980s commission. And you know that this is a peacetime livery because the hull number is so large and so apparent. Um, they would have painted those numbers much smaller and in a slightly less vibrant white just so that enemy aircraft would have a little bit of a harder time identifying which ship in particular they were firing on or even just in a reconnaissance purpose. Which ship is sitting out there? We don't know entirely which one. All we know is that it's in Iowa. But here in a peacetime livery, the hull numbers are made apparent so that uh, it would be easier to identify the ships for training purposes basically. However, approaching the quarter deck here, still on the gangway, there is the forward superstructure with the navigation bridge plainly evident, and of course the spotting tower there with the distinctive ears you can see just below the main battery fire director. That is a distinguishing feature that New Jersey gained in her 1968 refit. That was for electronic countermeasures equipment. However, there's turret two, the big guns, this is a battleship, and certainly that is something that is made very obvious to you before you even set foot on the main deck of New Jersey. Turret two, the three barrels raised to about 15 degrees, I want to say, yes. That is how the ship will say hello if you are on the wrong side of America. Having stepped aboard New Jersey now, this is the view that you will get looking up at the three barrels of turret one on the main deck. There they are, the 1650s pointed skyward, and as we sweep down, you just get a sense of how big these guns are. If the one in the parking lot didn't make that readily apparent to you, the three here on the ship itself, on turret one, definitely will. And as we pan down here, looking toward the face of turret one itself, you will see that there are these three bags around the breech ends of these guns. These are colloquially known as bloomers. And what these do, because these guns obviously have to elevate, there's going to be an open gap in the turret face. Obviously, that's an area where you're unarmored, so hopefully you don't get a very lucky hit right in the bloomers. But what this does is it keeps the weather out because Otherwise, if these were just allowed to remain open, you would start to get water in the turret and all kinds of nastiness. And obviously you don't want that because the turrets, they are far more than just the gun houses that you see here on the level of the main deck. The turrets go six decks all the way down through the hull. And um, there is a void space then underneath the turret, which is all a rotating structure, obviously, to support training and elevating these guns. So you don't want water getting in there, hence the bloomers are there. They have enough uh, degree of motion in their fitment to the turret face and to the, uh, the back of the guns here so that they can absorb recoil when the guns are fired as well as being able to deflect enough when these guns are elevated so that you never lose that weatherproof seal between the turret face and the outside world. Something else that presents itself as a viewing opportunity on turret one, if you know where to look, is the only remaining combat damage that New Jersey carries today. The ship, after being decommissioned at the end of World War II, she was reactivated for service off the coast of Korea during the Korean War, and New Jersey was the unfortunate recipient of a six-inch shell from a North Korean shore battery. The shell impacted along the face armor of turret number one. This armor is 17 inches thick, and it's also got some backing plates as well, so this is a substantially protected portion of the ship. So there was no damage done to the ship beyond the superficial damage that you can see here on the face of turret one. This is the leftmost ladder on the face of turret one from the perspective of if you were sitting inside the turret facing forward. So this is to viewer right, but to ship left. Of course, then the turret can train, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. If you look toward the base of this ladder, just below where you can see it's been blanked off just to keep ne'er-do-wells from climbing on top of the turret, because that might be a little bit dangerous, you can see that there is a weld bead sitting there that's just not attached to anything. 
That is the combat damage still carried by New Jersey, courtesy of that North Korean shore battery. Taking a closer look at that hit, that's it. You can see where the ladder support has just had to be shifted over by... I took a... I touched this. I measured it out with my fingers. It's a, about an inch and a half to the left. So rather than putting it over here, they have now gone boop, and it's over here now. That's the damage that New Jersey still has today from a six-inch shell from a North Korean shore battery, and that's it. That's the only visual sign that you have that this ship ever saw any sort of combat. Pretty remarkable considering how long this ship was in service. Damage to the ship is one thing, although it was so superficial that it hardly warrants a footnote in the history of New Jersey's long career. The reason why it's even remembered at all is because it was not without real human consequence. There were a number of sailors injured when that six-inch shell impacted that face armor on turret one. However, one of those men was not lucky enough to recover from his injuries. Seaman Robert Osterman was killed as a direct result of that engagement with the North Korean shore battery. And just as is anybody respected who decides to answer the call in service to his country, Seaman Osterman is still remembered aboard USS New Jersey today. He does have the distinction of being New Jersey's only combat fatality, and they have decided to erect this little plinth there permanently on the main deck right to the side of turret number one in his honor. So we do remember the sacrifice of Seaman Osterman here aboard New Jersey to this day. Just adjacent to the memorial plaque for Seaman Osterman, though, you will see that as of August 2023, New Jersey still in the midst of renovations to the main deck. This has been a multi-year and multi-million dollar project that the museum have put together to redeck these ships. The Iowas were the last ships of the U.S. Navy to utilize a wooden deck. Initially, that would have been teak. And the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial have elected to restore the wood deck of New Jersey with teak. They have achieved their goal of acquiring all the supplies necessary. However, the construction, as you can see, continues. And the immediate consequence of that construction means that, unfortunately, when I visited in August of 2023, the extreme forward end of the foxhole deck was closed off because, as you can see, there is some decking in place. However, it is just the bare steel deck beyond that, and it is not quite even. This was not designed to be walked on directly, so it's unfinished. There's some jagged edges there along the welds and rivet lines, and it's a tripping hazard. So they decide that the liability is not quite worth it, so they closed off the foxhole deck to visitors. However, in these pictures taken in 2022 when the foxhole deck was open, looking back toward the superstructure, you do get quite a sense of grandeur and awe once again, even from aboard the ship. You see the proportion of everything that is behind you. And yeah, you can definitely tell that this is something of absolutely immense proportion. Other features that are evident here on the foxhole deck are obviously the anchor chains and the windlasses and wildcats associated with raising and lowering the anchors. Each link of these chains weighs about 110 pounds or so. So these are immense structures in their own right. And you can see there, there is the hawse pipe going straight down to the water. Looking forward from the foxhole deck there, this is in 2019, before they had torn up a lot of the deck. You can see the proportion there of the bow. And then once again, that imposing superstructure with both forward battery turrets there, looking straight out to sea, yet oddly beckoning you to come inside. So upon descending your first of very many ladder ways on the foxhole deck, going down to what is called second deck, you board the ship on the main deck and you go down one level and now you are on what is called second deck. We'll get into what the decks are called in a moment, but you see that you are ushered into a crew birthing compartment. 
this compartment is very far forward on second deck, and you will see that they have many, many bunks in here, some of which are staged with some artifacts here, trying to emulate crew effects from the ship's final period of activity in the mid-1980s. So you will be able to tell this by the state of the uniforms, as well as some of the other items that you will see in these little storage lockers, which happen to be underneath the mattresses in the various bunks here. There are also a couple bunks that you can crawl into to try them on for size. I fit just fine. However, immediately forward of this crew berthing space is the anchor windlass room, as this strategically placed signboard tells you. What's happening in here is this area is housing all of the machinery, a combination of electrically powered, hydraulically powered, and steam powered winches, capstans, cables, and all manner of things that are associated with raising and lowering the anchors as well as some other of the mooring lines. So most of this machinery here is deactivated because a lot of it is steam powered and one of the restrictions that the museum has is that they're not allowed to raise steam. However, some of this equipment is still theoretically usable and will have to be used when New Jersey goes to dry dock probably in the next 12 months or so because we will have to be moving some mooring lines around and well we're going to be using some of this material here to do that. Iowa docked in the port of Los Angeles still uses this machinery for dropping and raising anchor when there are periods of high seas, high tides, and storms in the Los Angeles area. But you can see here this is the first of a great many machinery spaces on board New Jersey and the level of preservation in here is absolutely top-notch. In particular you can see, if you really want to zoom into these pictures, you can see all of the service tags on these gauges when they were last serviced and when they need to be recalibrated. Of course, they're all about 30 years out of date now. However, the attention to detail when the Navy put this ship away was still second to none. It is also here in the windless room that you will become very quickly acquainted with your first colloquially known pit of death. What this is, is a vertical ladderway that traverses five decks straight down to literally the bottom of the ship. This goes down to an ordnance storeroom down on seventh deck, which is the lowest deck on the vessel, the lowest deck in the hull, and the, the floor, the deck on seventh deck, is what they call the tank top. It is the top of the ship's triple bottom, so that is the lowest habitable space on the ship. You will start to look around corners, you will make sure you know where you're stepping because there are many hatches like this that just vertically drop into the bowels of the ship and of course they are roped off but they are only roped off and most hatches are kept open on New Jersey because it's the only way that you can ventilate these spaces and of course corrosion is an ever-present menace so if you can keep moisture out of these spaces because it is all steel after all and steel rusts the better for your long-term preservation of the ship so just be mindful of where you're stepping because this is very much a thing. It also bears mention at this point that someplace down here, as a matter of fact, if you go down three decks, you will eventually encounter a space called the Chain Locker. This is the Windless Room. It's there so that you have the machinery to raise and lower the anchors and anchor chain. The anchor chain has to go someplace when it's all retracted inside the ship, and that is the chain locker. The chain locker is on fifth deck down to seventh deck and actually through the triple bottom to an extent, down to the tank top, and it's where all of the anchor chain lives. Because the ship is so narrow in these forward compartments, there is actually no other way laterally to access these areas. So these vertical ladders are your only access to a great many spaces in the forward part of the ship. So when she was in service, you would have had sailors going up and down these ladders as if it was nothing. Personally, I really don't want to try it myself, but eh, I bet there's a technique to it. And this particular vertical ladderway actually extends all the way up to the main deck. This hatch in what is the overhead here for us on second deck, this is opening directly onto the main deck, someplace roughly amidships on the forecastle. So you can see the rationale for loading and unloading supplies because you have, a, you have an ordnance storeroom 
just below here on 6th and 7th decks. So, yes, uh, small arms ammunition, perhaps some 5-inch ammunition could be lowered through here. You're not going to be storing any appreciable ammunition for the main battery here because they have their own separate magazines, both for ammunition and powder. However, definitely uh, medium to large items could be dropped in through here, and you've got the hatch in the main deck to facilitate all of that. You've also got a ladder that, uh, in theory, could be used to climb down from the main deck all the way down to seventh deck to the tank top as well. So you can go from daylight all the way down to the fiery pits of hell just on a single ladderway. And from the somewhat foreboding and forbidding confines of the Anchor Windless Room, we are ushered aft into another crew berthing compartment. And, of course, another reminder that this is a warship. We have got emergency escape breathing devices here allocated for each bunk and therefore each crewman. We have instructions on how to use them as well, the rationale being if this space fills with smoke, you have got 15 minutes of filtered breathing air to get out of the ship. Of course, this being a birthing compartment for a whole bunch of men between the ages of 18 and 25 or so, we have to have the rules very clearly posted. So there are your Ten Commandments of this birthing space, very regimented of course, however, the guys did manage to have some fun along the way. You can see here, this is an example of what the museum calls sailor art. Something that is not especially authorized, but something that's not especially problematic either. I don't know the full rationale of what this figure is supposed to be representing. Obviously, it is a humanoid ape-like creature with a mop and bucket and roller skates. However, second to none, what could that possibly mean? Well, this birthing compartment is on second deck, and it is very far forward on the ship, which means that this compartment physically will arrive someplace before most of the rest of the ship, and second deck, meaning the main deck is above us, there are no people above us at any given time, which means that we are below no one and we are behind no one. So perhaps that's what was meant by second to none. And finally, right aft in this birthing compartment, we are confronted with another pit of death. This one, however, very nicely lit, and you'll see that it is punctuated by coins and bills. This is what the museum affectionately calls the wishing well, and you are actually encouraged to throw money down this ladder way. Of course, I do imagine that some lucky person has to then crawl down these ladders and collect all of that money because, of course, they are tax-deductible donations to the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. However, I did find that to be rather amusing, and of course, I did have to take some pictures of it. Finally, leaving the land of birthing compartments, we enter our first proper exhibit space here aboard New Jersey, and it is punctuated by a display showing the history of the name New Jersey in the U.S. Navy. We start off by reading a plaque about naming conventions of U.S. warships, battleships being historically named after states, cruisers after major cities, aircraft carriers after either famous battles or, more recently, former presidents. However, this space talks about all of that, and it also talks about, at length actually, the first USS New Jersey, which was BB-16. It was a Virginia-class battleship. Of course, it is so far removed from our own time. Built in 1902, launched in 1904, and commissioned in 1906, BB-16 basically has no resemblance whatsoever to BB-62. However, that was the first USS New Jersey. Of course, there is BB-62, on which we are at the present time. However, there is another New Jersey about to enter the United States Navy. USS New Jersey SSN-796 is a Virginia-class, coincidentally enough, submarine. Currently under construction, scheduled to be commissioned into the Navy in 2024. So we have got three generations of U.S. Navy ships bearing the name New Jersey, and of course we do have some exhibit space allocated to that. We've also got these absolutely delightful models of all three ships displayed here, which I did find to be very cool. Leaving the repurposed birthing compartment, which is now an exhibit space, we come across the first of many damage control lockers. New Jersey was well known in the Navy for being an expert damage control ship, and these damage control lockers are absolutely everywhere, including in spaces that are not documented on blueprints of the ship. Here you can see oxygen bottles for the onboard firefighting crews in terms of, well, we have a problem, we have to solve it. So they'll be using things like this. 
Your 10 commandments of damage control also posted in all of your damage control lockers, as is a little segment of a compartment checkoff list that you can just see there. However, you will also notice in every compartment on the ship this yellow panel. This is called a bullseye because they used to look different from this. They used to be a circular red, white, and blue stamp on a compartment bulkhead and it would tell you numerically where you are on the ship. They are very useful in navigating around New Jersey and therefore the museum takes the liberty of explaining to you how this system works. As you can see, they are pretty jam-packed full of information just on this little board. And there are two different ciphers, if you will, in terms of encoding the information on the bullseye. You have got your primary information, your first three lines telling you what deck you're on, the hull frames that the compartment spans, and how the space is designated to be used. Frames are not necessarily structural frames on the ship. It is a unit of measure rather than corresponding specifically to where the structural stringers are for the ship because the spacing on the frames changes depending on where you are on board the ship. However, they standardize the unit of measure so that you get an idea of where you are fore and aft and how much of the ship remains. The lower the number, the farther forward on the ship you are. Second division in this example here, that tells you which part of the ship's company is assigned to a given space in terms of maintaining and using that space. You also have a designator there, for example, it's 2-36-0, that tells you where you are. Are you on the center line of the ship? Are you port? Are you starboard? And then, of course, the space usage letter tells you what a space is supposed to be used for. The fourth line in this example, the A206L, that is an old bullseye designation that was used on the ship when it was first placed into commission in 1943. However, it was superseded in the 50s by the current system that you see here. So you will see these yellow bullseye panels in every compartment on the ship, and you'll see them in many photos to come. Basically, you have a sense of where you are just by having some sense of how to read these things. Again, the most important numbers there are the frame numbers. The lower they are, the farther forward on the ship you are. Continuing after we get into more crew quality of life spaces, this is the ship's store, or at least one of the ship's stores. You can tell that we have moved aft because you can see in the bullseye there, we're still on second deck, but we are now at a compartment that spans frames 79 to 82. So we are now about even with the barbette for turret one. Barbettes are the cylindrical spaces that surround the turrets. They are very heavily armored, as you might expect. But here in the ship's store, it is staged with period-correct merchandise in terms of what you might expect to see in the late 80s to very early 90s. Most popular of these items appear to be chocolate bars and cigarettes. And that, of course, is very ironic, considering the very large no smoking sign that you see here. But they have done a very nice job to stage this area with some sparse stocks, but some period correct stocks in terms of things that the men might actually want to buy. So it's a cool little space just to give you a sense of atmosphere in terms of what it would have been like when this ship was in service. However, also adjacent to this space is your first indication that something architecturally has changed in this part of the ship. You see this absolutely massive hatch, and there are dozens of others like it scattered throughout the ship. This is the top of what is called the Armored Citadel. This is the structural core of the ship. This is the most heavily armored single area aboard an Iowa-class battleship. This extends from third deck at about the level of the turret one barbette, and it extends aft all the way down to the barbette of turret three, actually just beyond the barbette of turret three. This area contains all of the absolutely critical parts of the ship, the critical spaces that contain your command and control infrastructure, your magazine spaces for your primary and secondary batteries, all of your engineering spaces. You have got an auxiliary steering position in the forward part of the armored citadel called Central Station, which we'll see later. You have got your steering gear in the citadel. You have got another auxiliary steering position right aft around the steering gear, all contained within the armored citadel. So this is a, a six inch thick armored deck at the top of third deck, and that extends all the way down to seventh deck 
in your engineering spaces, in your fire and turbine rooms. So in the worst case scenario, if you have your bow and stern shot away, you have your superstructure shot away. In theory, all of your turrets, the barbettes around the turrets, and the armored citadel would have enough reserve of buoyancy and enough structural integrity to keep the ship afloat and, in theory, still fighting, at least with your main battery turrets and whatever secondary battery mounts may remain. So that is your first indicator of this tremendous armor scheme that the designers came up with for these ships. It is an example of what is called the all-or-nothing armor scheme. Thus far, all of the areas of the ship that we have seen are unarmored. They have splinter protection. The shell plating would afford some degree of protection from small arms fire, perhaps up to 50 caliber small arms fire, as well as splinters from nearby explosions, mines, shell hits in terms of glancing blows. But anything appreciable, any sort of direct hit from battleship grade guns, it's going to go straight through the unarmored parts of the ship. So all of your birthing compartments that we've seen, sorry guys, but once you're in the citadel or you're inside the turret barbettes or you're inside the armored conning tower, which you'll also see later on, now you're talking about a completely different ball game in terms of what we can do and what we can withstand. So all of your hatches from second deck to third deck, they look like this because again, you're going through six inches of armored steel to get lower down into the ship from this point. More architectural indications that something has changed. This is on the extreme starboard side of second deck, about even with the barbette for turret two. So we've moved a little bit farther aft and you can see the joinery that you're starting to come across here because we are now starting to join unarmored parts of the ship to armored parts of the ship. So up is up and down is down in these pictures and uh, you can see that as we approach the deck here on second deck the top of third deck is the deck of second deck meaning that we are joining unarmored steel to armored steel so you see these scalloped gusset plates that are secured with welds and rivets and what rivets these are you can see here that they are sitting more or less flush to the surrounding plate which means that these are countersunk rivets all of these rivets would have been placed by hand of course with machinery assisting, but handheld machinery placing these rivets in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard when New Jersey was being built between 1940 and 1942. A great deal of this work was actually done by women because, of course, the United States had entered World War II by the end of the construction period for New Jersey, so... The museum likes to quote a figure of about 30% of structural work on New Jersey was actually completed by women. I don't know how true that actually is or how they verify that information, but what really gets me about this is you see the precision, the symmetry, the perfection in many ways that you can see in the structural parts of this ship. And this is just one compartment on second deck. Everywhere where you can see the structural members of this ship, you see this absolutely everywhere. And then you remember that all of these rivets and all of these welds were done by hand by somebody who probably was not trained as a machinist or as a construction worker. But they learned really fast and then they did their job and they did it well and they did it to such a high standard and they must have felt tremendous pride doing this because 81 years later, it still looks this good. I don't think we create things like this anymore in 2023, and I really wish we would, because things like this really stand as a testament to the people who put these things together, not just the designers, not just the people who did the calculations, but the people who physically followed the blueprints and built the thing. They left their mark all over this ship, and it looks like this, and it is absolutely spellbinding. And upon passing through the second deck berthing compartments, the ship's store, and a dental office, you are then ushered up a ladderway back up to the main deck, whereupon you encounter the officer's wardroom. The wardroom was the place where most of the ship's officers would have taken their meals. It's also where upper-level meetings would have occurred among the officers on board the ship. Also, it features a cabin off of the wardroom. This would be for visiting dignitaries, or in some cases, perhaps even the CO or XO would be using this. I believe perhaps this actually was an XO cabin once upon a time. However, pretty nice accommodations nonetheless. The wardroom today, though, it is, first of all, a very nicely climate-controlled space, so if 
you visit New Jersey on a hotter day, as I did, once you get up to the wardroom, you are definitely welcoming the air conditioning. Not to say that there is not air conditioning on second deck, but they've really made sure that it works very well in the wardroom, because in addition to being a very wide open space with some seating, as well as some water available on the ship at this point, they also use the wardroom for hosting a great many events aboard the ship. It is one of the spaces that you can actually rent out if you did want to host your own event aboard USS New Jersey. However, it is very nicely appointed. They don't serve any hot food on the ship anymore. When I visited in 2019, they did, and they actually did that in crew mess underneath the fantail on second deck well aft. However, that is something that they will do if you do want to cater an event aboard New Jersey. You've got to bring the food on because they can't exactly cook on board, at least not using the onboard systems, but the wardroom is available for that. For me, though, the main attractions of the wardroom are these absolutely wonderful scale models of New Jersey and a couple of other ships that are available for your viewing pleasure. This model here depicting New Jersey as she would have appeared right after her 1983 dry dock refit period as she was re-entering service for the final time for her fourth commission, 1980s to very early 1990s. She looks resplendent there. However, this one is probably the most interesting, and this is one of the models that's been featured on Battleship. New Jersey's YouTube channel. This is showing New Jersey circa 1983, however, being extensively refit and largely rebuilt to be what is called technically a hybrid battleship. I tend to call these concepts battle carriers. This is something that you may be somewhat more familiar with if you play the video game World of Warships or World of Warships Blitz, if you've ever played with the Tier 9 battleship Kearsarge. That is based uh, very loosely on what appears to be most similar to North Carolina hull, but it's got a full flight deck with a main battery of 16-inch guns in four triple turrets, and it's a weird thing. However, the concept actually existed, and the concept was revised and revived in the 1980s when it came to recommissioning the Iowa-class battleships. There was some thinking that we might want to convert the battleships into battle carriers. In other words, let's put a ski jump over the fan tail and have it terminate just aft of midships. Let's remove turret three and replace it with vertical launch tubes so we can turn the battleships into missile boats as well as being able to operate to some limited extent stall aircraft, short takeoff and landing. In these days that would have been either helicopters or the Harrier and that effectively would have been the only fighter bomber option available at that time. I don't know if there was any plan to fit catapult to any of the Iowas when they were mulling over this possible conversion, but obviously this did not occur. Very clearly, we had aircraft carriers, including supercarriers, even nuclear-powered supercarriers at the time via USS Enterprise entering service in the mid-1960s. However, the idea was still floated. Ultimately, none of the Iowas ever received anywhere near as radical of a conversion or refit during their 1980s reactivation periods, and they all more or less maintained their original fit-out and armament as they were designed with all the way back in the early 1940s. However, USS New Jersey, shown as a battle carrier, is available here in about 1-200 scale, I would like to say, in the officer's wardroom on the main deck of USS New Jersey, if you do wish to view this. Also, again, check out USS New Jersey's YouTube channel for some more information about the Battle Carrier Iowa concept. The model parade continues in the officer's wardroom with this wonderful display of one of the main battery turrets. You can see here that the turret is far more than what is visible from the main deck, the gun house. You can see the three barrels there, one elevated. However, this is a very good representation of the structure of the barbette as well as the structure of the turret itself. You can see the inner part of the turret, the proper part of the turret, that all rotates. So you can see the two shell slats there that are on sequential levels, one on top of the other. That is where the men would be parbuckling those 2,700 pound armor piercing shells in the worst case toward the shell hoists. And then over top here, this is the stereotypical turret that most people think of. We can tell that this is in the World War II era because we've got two World War II Korean War era life rafts on the side of the turret there. And we know that this is not turret one today because we've got rangefinders on either side. We can see 
see the right side of the turret with the rangefinder. However, that is a fantastic representation of what one of these 1650 turrets is. You can also see here that we have got the ability for the guns to elevate independently, which means that this is not a triple turret, technically speaking. This is a three-gun turret. A triple turret would indicate that all of the guns would elevate in unison. However, each gun can be elevated independently. Obviously, they all train, they traverse at the same rate in the same direction because they're all attached to the same rotating structure, but they can elevate independently. They do have to return to a five degree loading angle. So that's why in a lot of the historical footage, you'll see when the guns fire, they immediately start dropping down. That's the way that they have to be loaded for all the spanner trays and things to come in so that they can ram all the stuff back into the breach for round two. However, fantastic representation of an Iowa class turret here in the officer's wardroom. What is undoubtedly the centerpiece of the officer's wardroom though is this absolutely massive 196th scale replica of New Jersey as she would have appeared in about 1982-1983 by Gil Yofredo of Bayonne, New Jersey. I don't know anything about Mr. Yofredo other than that he evidently is an absolute master modeler. And the connection between New Jersey and Bayonne, as in the ship New Jersey and Bayonne, New Jersey, a little bit more than you might expect. New Jersey, of course, was built in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on the Delaware River, right across, ironically enough, from Camden. However, Iowa was built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in Brooklyn, New York. However, Iowa would have been too large with her superstructure entirely fitted out to pass under the Brooklyn Bridge, meaning that, well, Iowa needed to be floated out of that channel without her superstructure and a lot of other things fitted. So Iowa would have been fitted out in Bayonne, New Jersey. New Jersey herself also would have spent some time at Bayonne, at the Bayonne Navy Yard. They weren't building ships like this at the Bayonne Yard, but they were fitting them out. They were doing what they called inclination tests, at least on Iowa herself. There are pictures of this. I'm not sure if New Jersey would have undergone similar testing at Bayonne, but New Jersey would have spent significant time at Bayonne, particularly during her shakedown deployment into the Atlantic, which was effectively a glorified Tirpitz raid, and then obviously New Jersey would have been transferred over with Iowa to the Pacific Theater. But Bayonne does actually have a connection with USS New Jersey and the Iowa class in general, obviously as Missouri also would have been built at the Brooklyn Naval Yard and probably spent some time at Bayonne during her fit out and initial sea trials. Surveying this absolutely resplendent model though, and I invite you to pause the video at any point if you'd like a closer look at any of these pictures. The detail here is tremendous. The workmanship, the craftsmanship is tremendous and it's almost a shame to have to keep this behind glass because you get the distortion and the reflection from the display case. But from what we can see here, we are looking at something that is absolutely masterful and it is more or less pretty accurate in terms of portraying the ship as she appears even today as a museum sitting there at Camden. Obviously some configurations in terms of the paint on the turrets, the number 62 is missing from turret two, for example. The orientations of some of the secondary battery guns, a little bit different, a little bit different rigging there in terms of the main uh, mass, the tripod mass there. However, for the most part, this is how the ship looks as you stand aboard her looking at this model. You've even got the, the unrep boom there with all the cabling and hoses hanging off of it. Turret 3, the fantail. The decking on the main deck around the fantail around turret 3, that is different nowadays. The decking extends all the way out to the sides of the ship rather than that, uh, that non-slip heat-resistant coating that is on the helipad still today. But they were also using the fantail to launch some of the pioneer drones in the 1980s with these Jado rocket bottles off of the fantail so they wanted some heat resistance there so they took up some of the teak and they replaced it with that non-skid heat resistant coating however now the uh, ship uh, has all of her teak decking all the way out to the sides on the fantail once again but the detailing that is here pretty true to life in terms of what you see aboard the ship obviously there is no helicopter on the helipad nowadays that's uh, now an event space that's covered with tents most of the time but 
there is a helicopter on the fantail just adjacent to turret 3 when you go out there much later on. But yes, 196 scale model of New Jersey in the wardroom. That is an absolutely tremendous piece. And it does help you really get your bearings on the ship as well. And it helps you appreciate the things that you have seen and get a little bit more excited about the things that are yet to come. Now, heading aft from the wardroom, we start to get into what are really the only proper museum-type exhibit spaces on the ship. The main deck was largely gutted and then retrofitted into a stereotypical museum space when the ship first opened as a museum in October 2001. This is something that the current curatorial staff don't appear to endorse all that much. They tend to be, as far as I can see, they tend to be far more conservative in terms of their curatorial philosophy. They want to preserve the ship as she is. They want to present her as she is. The work that they do aboard New Jersey, it is aimed at rehabilitating spaces so that they could be entered by the general public and added to the tour route as well as uh, being made available for either curators tours or other tour packages that you might buy as a museum, as a guest of the museum. But that was not necessarily the curatorial philosophy of the ship's original caretakers. It's always been the same organization that has operated the battleship since she fell into the hands of the museum, but different curatorial staff have come and go over the years, and this is an artifact of that initial curatorial philosophy when New Jersey opened. New Jersey was only the second of the Iowas to open as a public museum. Missouri was the first one. Um, 1998, I believe, she came to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and then started to open for tours. But New Jersey is really the first of the Iowas to open in the public eye. Missouri's still at Pearl Harbor. She still is kind of, sort of, in the custody of the Navy in terms of she's on Navy property, but operated by the Park Service nowadays. New Jersey, though, it's a 100% civilian outfit from start to finish, and just some differences in opinion in terms of how best to present an artifact like this, because the ship itself is the first and primary artifact. Of course, she is almost 900 feet long, she's 108 feet wide, and she's 45,000 tons. She's a big space, and you can do a lot with the space that's offered on a, on a vessel this size, but the vessel is also the artifact, and she has a story to tell in being the way that she is. And the current curatorial staff, they recognize that, and they try to present New Jersey for that, for the content and the context that she herself can offer. But you, you'll see what I mean here as we go into this first curatorial space in terms of museum space. So, just after the wardroom, it's a bullseye, cool. Yep, cool. And there we are. See so again, this kind of stuff, not Yeah. It's it's jarring. And as we continue to walk through this exhibit space here, I've got to say, I don't like the idea of having stripped out original material from the ship to replace it with exhibits. I know that there is a purpose, and particularly there is a purpose to this one, because World War II is the reason that this ship exists at all. Obviously, the authorization for the Iowas was before the United States entered into World War II, but... All of the ships were completed after the entrance of the United States into the war because after the attack of Pearl Harbor. But, again, I am here because I appreciate the story of the ship via what the ship is able to tell me just by being the way that she is. If I want to research Admiral Halsey, for example, whose picture is there on the cover of Time magazine, if I want to research the anti-Japanese propaganda and the maltreatment of Japanese Americans during the war, I can do that myself. I want to see the ship. Yes, I recognize the purpose of exhibit spaces like this, but uh, not really my style, I must say. However, the space that you're looking at here was probably the most interesting part of the World War II type exhibit. 
This is actually one of the air intakes for one of the fire rooms. And the way that an Iowa class engineering plant is subdivided is you have four engine rooms and you have four fire rooms. So you have eight separate main engineering spaces down there along the tank top off of an area called Broadway that we'll get to much later on. But you've got boiler rooms or fire rooms and then you have separated engine rooms. That's where your main turbines are and your gearboxes are for running the propeller shafts directly out the back of the ship. So you need air, obviously, to make fire work. You need air, you need a fuel source, and you need a source of ignition. That's the fire triangle. These are the big air intakes for those boilers. And you'll see that we have got this sort of honeycomb pattern. It's a circular pattern, but a honeycomb pattern nonetheless in the deck here. That is actually armor. This is steel grating that is armored because it was initially thought, and it would have been thought during the uh, construction of the Iowa class ships, it was initially thought that at the Pearl Harbor attack, that battleship Arizona, which was lost in the attack, was lost because a bomb or torpedo or something dropped from an attacking Japanese airplane fell down either one of the uptakes or one of the exhaust funnel stacks on battleship Arizona, and it enabled the bomb to detonate deep within the ship and cause the fatal damage which ultimately sunk the Arizona. Turns out that later forensic analysis of the video footage, eyewitness testimony, as well as the wreck of Arizona herself says otherwise, but it was in conventional wisdom at the time that the Iowas were being laid down. So they added this armor grating in the uptakes in the funnel spaces on the Iowas just to try and mitigate that possibility. I believe you also had some similar retrofits made to the later South Dakota class battleships at very least. Also other ships being built by foreign powers also featured armored uptakes or armored exhausts because of situations like these, or they simply had a more circuitous path for the fluids, as in gases, to follow before they entered or exited the ship, just so that there was no direct route from above down into a critical engineering space. But this is how, at least partially, they did it on the Iowa's, this armored uptake space. And it is actually very interesting to see. As you continue on the main deck, there are further exhibit spaces that highlight things such as traditions of the Navy, crew life aboard, things of that nature. They are all museum type exhibit spaces. And I know the educational purpose of them, but again, I personally don't like the idea of having stripped out authentic parts of the ship to add things back that don't necessarily tell the story of the ship. However, eventually, another space that you will come to is the captain's in-port cabin. This is, as the name suggests, the place where the captain would be residing whenever the ship is in port. It's also a place where he may have meetings as well as store his formal dress, things like that, while at sea. However, the captain does have a dedicated at-sea cabin as well. Uh, one of the things, though, that you will notice in this space, though, is this cabinet that contains the ship's silver service. What this is, is really fine china meant for entertaining dignitaries. And a battleship, in addition to being a tremendous combat asset, is also a tremendous diplomatic asset. It's a big ship with big guns, and it makes a big impression wherever it goes. So you would be hosting foreign dignitaries, ambassadors, heads of state, things of this nature, when the battleship would visit a port. So you needed a place for that to happen, and that's where the captain's import cabin comes into play, as well as the silver set. The silver set in particular, though, this actually dates back to the early 1900s, and it was commissioned for USS New Jersey BB-16, not BB-62. Once New Jersey BB-62 came into commission, the silver service that had been held by the governor of New Jersey at the Drumthwacket Mansion, that was recalled to be placed aboard the battleship where it resided for the duration of USS New Jersey's various commissions. Today, the silver service is officially shared between the governor's office at Drumthwacket as well as aboard USS New Jersey as a museum. The punch bowl is the chicken or the egg fiasco, though, because the punch bowl is officially owned by the governor's office. The battleship also wants it on display, so for half of the year, the governor has 
the punch bowl, and for half of the year, the battleship has the punch bowl, and they have a little tongue-in-cheek ceremony when they hand over command of the punch bowl. So it's one of the traditions that is kept alive by the museum today, and the state of New Jersey, of course, is happily uh, coinciding in cooperation with that. However, uh, a couple other interesting artifacts in here that you will see are uh, this placard, as well as this sculpture of the christening bottle, or the christening bottle holder, that uh, was used in the commissioning and launching of USS New Jersey before the ship was launched on December 7th, 1942 the ship would have been christened as is tradition and uh, the bottle that was smashed against the bow of course is destroyed although fragments of the bottle are still retained by the museum this replica of the holder that the fragments of the bottle are kept in was commissioned a few years ago and is permanently kept on display aboard USS New Jersey in the captain's import cabin so pretty cool connection to the history of the ship here Something else interesting in here, a little bit unexpected for me, this telephone, which is not original to 1940s New Jersey, but probably was there in the 80s, I would say for sure. This is not an artifact per se. This is still an active ship's phone, as the signage says there, but it impressed me uh, because they even bother to tell you what is an artifact and what is still active equipment on board down to signage that says non-original signage. So I did get a kick out of that, but the captain's import cabin is another event space that you can rent aboard New Jersey if you want to host an event there. So yes, they do have the need to call in and out of that space, I suppose. And they use that phone, amongst other things, to do that. Something else, though, as you go more into the captain's actual living quarters in terms of where his bedrooms and uh, such are, is this obviously handmade, I believe, wooden model of New Jersey looks to be roughly 1700 scale or so, but I'm quite sure that this wouldn't have been a precisely measured piece. But this model may well be the first ever model, at least semi-professionally done, of USS New Jersey. And apparently it was presented to Captain E.M. Thompson, who was the commanding officer of New Jersey from November 17th, 1945 to August 3rd, 1946. So immediate post-war command for Captain Thompson of New Jersey. And this model was presented to him as a gift from the crew at the end of his command aboard ship. I uh, would reckon, but very interesting to see this on display. I don't know who made it. I don't know how old it is precisely, other than we say that it can't possibly date from later than August 3rd, 1946. So very interesting and fairly well detailed for what it is. It's a waterline model, of course, but you can obviously see we've got the main battery turrets there, which appear to be able to rotate a bit, as well as the secondary battery, 5-inch 38. Superstructure shows New Jersey's refit for the end of the war with the enclosed bridge. So yeah, this is a very nicely done model for what it is, and it would have been a really cool gift for a departing commanding officer. This space here, uh, this is shot from just outside of the captain's import cabin looking at, uh, I believe, the uh, executive officer's bathroom and uh, his cabin is nearby. What I'm doing here, though, looking in the shower, is uh, I misremembered something. I am looking for the door in the captain's shower. It's not here on the main deck. Where that actually is, is on the 04 level just aft of the navigation bridge, which makes more sense because the captain's at sea cabin, obviously he would be there at sea, and if he needed quick access to the bridge, well, he may have to run out of the shower to do that. This little space here, I opened the door because uh, it explicitly said do not use for storage, and they use it for storage today. <laughs> There's the old uh, 1980s vintage vacuum cleaner in there. Uh, another little cabinet here. This really is just a cabinet with some shelves, but uh, again, if there are any unlocked doors aboard a battleship, you must open them. It is a rule. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, regardless here, this, I believe this is the uh, XO's cabin, the executive officer's cabin. He's got uh, a space here. I suppose this could also be used for any visiting officers who may come aboard the ship. Uh, there was something here I can't quite recall about uh, this was for the commander of a destroyer cruiser group. Not sure, but uh, nice digs nonetheless. However, this, we get into the captain's 
uh, in port cabin, the seating area here. And then we've got this model, which is not of an Iowa. I do go on to explain in some detail what this actually is. And this is not New Jersey or any of the Iowas. This is Montana or Montana class. This was what they had uh, initially thought up of uh, replacing the Iowa class um, because the Washington and London treaties before World War II restricted the displacement on capital ships. Battleships could be 35,000 tons. So the earlier class, the South Dakota class and the North Carolina class were built to 35,000 tons. When Japan decided that they were going to not ratify the second version of the treaty and uh, just blow it out of the water, literally, they built, they refit the Congo class cruiser. And uh, we speculated that they were over 35,000 tons. So we invoked the escalator clause to the Washington Treaty to go to 45,000 tons. So that's how you get the Iowas. Um, the Montanas were supposed to succeed the Iowas and they didn't have a displacement limit. We thought at the time that Japan was building a class of battleships, which turned out to be the Yamato class, which they did build two of, three, um, if you count the one that became a carrier. Um, they were 70,000 tons. We thought that they were only going to be about 55, 60,000. So the Montanas were going to be built to about 65,000 tons or so to split the difference. And this is what they were going to be. They were going to be a slightly longer Iowa with four main battery turrets. So we've only got turret three out the back here. This has got two at the fat tail. Otherwise, very similar, a little bit slower because I think they were going to have the same power plants as the Iowas, but that was the plan. Thankfully, we didn't need it. Leaving the captain's in-port cabin and actually going back down to second deck, this is one of the spaces that have been repurposed many times throughout the ship's career. Here in its latest specification, it is a 1980s era radio and general communications space. Uh, lots of teletype in here, some printers in here, as well as some radio equipment, both for Morse transmissions as well as for voice transmissions. Some of the equipment in here is made to look like it is still operating, so every once in a while something will pop off and paper will fly through a machine or a typewriter will start clicking all by itself so it appears at times that the equipment in this space is being operated by a platoon of ghosts however moving farther aft still on second deck you pass by the carpenter shop and this is one of the spaces on the ship that actually is still active and still being used for its original purpose there are a number of woodworking activities that do still need to happen aboard the ship none the least of which is the restoration of the main deck the teak wood on the main deck and some of the work for that is being done in this space so not only do you still see the equipment and all the tools and stuff in here but it still smells like woodworking has occurred recently because well woodworking has occurred recently in this space so it's an example of some of the original equipment on the ship still being used in the way that it was intended which i think is really cool Walking on second deck, you are constantly reminded, though, that this is the lowest unarmored portion of the hull. Beginning on third deck, you are then within the armored box, the armored citadel, and all of the hatches that traverse second and third deck, they look like this, because this is the six-inch armored plate that is forming the deck of second deck into third deck. So you're passing through that to enter the citadel anytime that you go down from second deck. So all the hatches look like this. And here, right aft, heading into the crew mess area, general enlisted mess, you see this step in the deck. This is actually the aftermost boundary of the armored citadel. Where you see in the upper portion of the image, that is the top of the armored deck between second and third deck showing you the top of the citadel. Everything aft of this point is unarmored. So that step in the deck is about six inches high. That is physically the top of the deck armor where it cuts off in the after part of the ship. So everything aft of basically where I'm standing, I'm in the unarmored part of the ship here in the mess hall. This is unarmored. This could in theory be shot away if things really went to hell. Everything forward of that step is within 
within the Citadel boundaries, obviously one deck lower. And that is where all of your core infrastructure and your primary reserve of buoyancy is contained within the ship. So right here, a very stark reminder of the architecture that's going on just beneath you as you're walking around on second deck. And it's really cool, but it is a feature that you won't know about unless you know about it. So of course, I had to note it. So we are starboard side aft, coming into the mess deck, and this little ledge, this is the armored deck right below us. We're on uh, second deck, third deck is going into the uh, citadel. So we're raised a little bit here. You step over the threshold, the fantail area is now unarmored. You are beyond turret three. So that's how they did it. I love making note of these architectural features on the ship whenever I come across them. It's really cool. And uh, I also just like the atmosphere that you get, particularly in this space, because not only is it a communal area where most of the crew would have taken their meals, but you also hear a lot of the machinery still running in the background, main, mainly air handling stuff today. But just the sights and sounds and the smells, they come together in this space, and it really does fill up the atmosphere of I'm on a battleship. Of course, all of the food that would be consumed in the mess area would have to be prepared someplace, and most of that would have been prepared here in the enlisted galley. A galley is nautical talk for the kitchen. In this case, pretty big kitchen, where you have to serve three meals a day at least for as many as 25 to 2700 men, at least in World War II wartime configuration. So lots of work happening in these spaces. This is the bakery portion of the galley, which uh, this is a new addition to the tour route in the last couple of years, but this absolutely enormous 1940s vintage standing mixer, you can imagine how many loaves of bread and dessert niceties and whatnot would have been prepared in this over the decades. And another thing that I really appreciated here, you can see we have got some staged flatbreads or baguettes or donuts or something like that and an American flag themed cake here in the background. One nice touch that the pictures just can't convey to you is how it smells in here. The Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial, they, I believe, admitted a couple of years ago in one of their YouTube videos that they were a little bit envious of USS Missouri, another Iowa-class battleship, now a museum. Missouri set up their bakery uh, to smell like an active bakery, particularly they uh, are wafting the smell of donuts through their bake shop. So now if you visit the bakery on USS New Jersey, you will also smell donuts. So it's a nice touch. I just wish that they're actually was something to eat in here because it really was quite convincing. And also around crew mess, you have this bulletin board which is displaying a menu that would have been served to general crew on 18 October 1986. I don't know if this particular board survives from that date in New Jersey's active service history or if it has been since recreated from notes by the museum, but in either case, you can see what would have been served in the general mess hall on second deck. Ginger pot roast, sauerkraut, simmered carrots, broccoli, and buttered potatoes. Honestly, I think I'd have to go for the pot roast and potatoes. Sounds pretty good to me after a long day's work. Another feature that caught my attention here in Crew Mess, although not one that is by any means unique to Crew Mess, they just happen to be plainly evident here, is one of these. This is a sounding hatch, and you can see that we've got the word sound that's stamped into that outer, looks to be, brass ring. Obviously, a ship needs fuel, and a ship like this carried an awful lot of fuel. Initially, it would have been burning a fuel called Bunker C, which is a barely refined version of crude oil. Basically, pump that stuff out of the ground, put it through a couple of refining steps, and then pump it aboard ship and burn it. In the 1980s, in New Jersey's last commission, they would have been burning what's basically a marine-grade diesel. However, whether it's Bunker C or diesel, it is liquid fuel, and it needs to be stored in tanks. There are many tanks around the hull of an Iowa-class battleship. Some of them form parts of the torpedo defense, and some of them are strictly for fuel stowage and therefore ballasting. But wherever they are, you need to be able to determine how much liquid is in those tanks. There is no one master fuel gauge for a battleship, so what you do to figure out how much fuel is in the tanks and where that fuel is, in other words, which tanks are full, 
Well, you need to take detailed records of when you take fuel on, and then you also need to make periodic checks of your tanks as you burn fuel off, so you can determine how much gas you got left, first of all, so you can determine more or less what your range is, but it's also important to know where the fuel is for trimming the ship. In other words, keeping the thing ballasted correctly so that you maintain an even keel. You want fuel to burn down symmetrically, forward, aft, port, and starboard, and you can pump fuel around depending on what your needs are for trimming the ship, how much other stuff are you carrying, where is that, etc. But you would take measurements with quite literally a long dipstick, you would stick it into a port like this, and you'd pull it out and see where the fuel was, or in some cases where the water was on that dipstick, and that will give you a roundabout reading of how much liquid you've got in a given tank. And obviously there are spaces like these all over the ship, but here in crew mess you do see several of these in the floor, and I thought that was very interesting to take a look at. Another couple of spaces in this general area. This first one, the steam heat filter shop. Everything on this ship is steam powered in one way or another. Steam gives you the capability, obviously, to drive the ship through the water, but beyond that, steam is powering your electricity for your lighting as well as for your navigation and radar equipment. It's providing electricity to run the electric motors that then generate the hydraulic pressure to operate your turrets, your ammunition hoists, your powder hoists, everything you can imagine. It comes down to either electrical power or hydraulic power, both of those being generated either directly or indirectly by steam, obviously heat. Climate control on the ship, particularly as it was originally designed, all driven by steam as well. The ship did not originally have air conditioning. That was something that was only added in the 1980s as the military transferred from being conscription-based to volunteer-based. You needed to make the ships a little bit more habitable for the people who were literally volunteering a decent chunk of their lives to serve on board. However, Filters everywhere, all over this thing. Why? Number one, air quality. But number two, some of these filters would also be uh, filtering intake air in the uptakes for the boilers. So you want to, just like uh, you have in your car, you want to make sure that you're getting as clean and consistent airflow as possible into your engine. Well, same thing for these boilers. So this is the shop dedicated just to upkeeping, maintaining, cleaning, repairing, and replacing all of the assorted filters that somehow interface with air handling equipment as well as the steam handling equipment on board. And because everything on this ship is in one way or another powered by steam, these guys would always have something to do. So it would make sense that they'd have a dedicated space exclusively for these purposes. And another space here on second deck, as you can see from the bullseye in the background there, this is the electric motor repair shop. There are something along the lines of 300 electric motors aboard the ship, and they're all associated with operating menagerie of equipment. However, they will all need to be repaired, if not outright reconstructed at times, and this is where that can happen. In addition to the battleship itself being a very large and very complicated piece of equipment, it also has a huge reserve of buoyancy. And because it's got that huge reserve of buoyancy, you can have these dedicated repair facilities on board. This ship also has a metal foundry on board as well, which means that you can cast steel parts if you have to. So really, in addition to being a great combat asset, being able to land those big 16-inch shells on demand wherever they're required, the battleships also were designed in a way to be mobile bases and mobile supply depots. The ship carries an awful lot of fuel for its own use as well as for the use of other ships in its group. You can do underway replenishments to transfer fuel between ships if you really have to. Because you've got these big repair facilities on board, again, the motor winding shop, the, the steam heat filter shop, the metal foundry, there's a carpenter shop as well on board. Not only can you repair yourself to some extent, but you could also take on small projects from other ships in your group and you could repair their stuff as well. So the battleship, in addition to being this command and control post out there in the middle of the ocean, very highly protected via all the armor that we talked about, very highly defended via its own guns as well as the other ships escorting it, it's also really there to be a mobile base. It's got this great redundancy built in. It's got this great 
repair capacity, and of course, in wartime, you could have 2,500 plus men aboard a ship like this. You have got such tremendous resource available out there, mobile, on demand, in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the combat theater. That's really what these ships were designed to be. Yes, they're great in combat, but they are logistic powerhouses as well. And when the battleships were brought back into active service in the 1980s, they built battle groups around the battleships, just like you would see today with aircraft carriers being the center of a strike group. They had battleships in those roles, same as aircraft carriers. So they were, they're also capital ships, obviously. So they were designed with that in mind. Command, control, offense, defense, and supply and repair. Really, they were a catch-all solution. And to me, it's a shame that we don't have that capability with the modern Navy. Yes, aircraft carriers can do all these things too, but the battleships, they could do it as well as fight all on their own as they were. The aircraft carrier is nothing without its escort ships and its aircraft. Continuing on second deck, we get to what is probably the most coveted space aboard USS New Jersey, particularly if you happen to be an enlisted crew member, the post office. There is very little link to the outside world when you're aboard ship, even less so when you remember that New Jersey's first tour of duty was during World War II, particularly out in the Pacific, meaning that you are thousands of miles away from the nearest friendly landmass and you have absolutely no link to the outside world. Voice transmission on radio is still more or less in its infancy in the 1940s, never mind things like the internet or satellite phones or anything like that. So the post office was your only link to the outside world. Also coming through the post office would have been your pay. So this was a very important space for all of your crew members and particularly your enlisted guys because this would be your only opportunity to talk to people outside of your own little world aboard your ship. Your officers at very least, maybe they have access to the radios and they can talk to other ships directly or even talk to land stations directly. But you enlisted guys, this is it. Your letters to and from home, they'd be coming through here. Your pay would be coming through here. Your money orders to send money back home to pay debts or parking tickets that you might have back home. It's all coming through here. And you better believe that a mail delivery, as haphazard as it must have been, particularly in World War II in the Pacific, a mail delivery marked a very joyous day, I am quite sure. Now leaving the post office and continuing to walk around second deck, you can see this interesting feature. What is this? Well, this is actually a projectile hoist in support of the 5-inch secondary battery. The Iowa-class battleships initially would have been built with 10 twin 5-inch 38 caliber gun mounts, and they would have been mounted on either side of the superstructure port and starboard. Today, all four of the Iowas have lost some of those mounts because they were retrofitted in the 1980s to carry missiles. However, a great number of those mounts remain, and they were supported by ammunition hoists such as this. You would have had powder and projectiles separate until they met in the gun room, of course. However, the interesting thing about these hoists is that they do not need to be directly underneath the mounts. As you can see here, this hoist is almost tilted over about 90 degrees because obviously there is a magazine space below here in the citadel, which remember the citadel begins on third deck, one deck below where we are right now, and your projectile is going to come up and eventually make its way into the 5 inch turret where the crews will then pick it up out of the hoists where the fuse will also be set on fused projectiles and then load it into the breech of the gun. A powder canister will come up from its own hoist, from its own magazine, and then the powder and projectile will meet in the breech of the gun, the breech closed, and then the gun will be fired. It's a similar process to the 16-inch battery. However, a bit smaller. These projectiles are only 5 inches in diameter versus the big 16-inchers. However, same process. You do not have an integral cartridge for any of the primary or secondary battery armament on a ship like this. So if you're more familiar with small arms ammunition, get that out of your head. Does not really apply. But interesting feature here to note that these hoists could be not quite anywhere, but they didn't have to be directly underneath the 5-inch turrets, unlike all of the hardware in support of the 16-inch turrets. 
Still on second deck here, and this caught my attention because I think that this ladder way is the steepest non-vertical internal ladder on the whole ship. I believe that there actually was a YouTube video put out by the museum probably about two years ago now that featured this ladder way in particular in a video where they were talking about how do you go up and down the ladders? Is it better to go backwards or forwards? And that sort of thing. Pretty sure this is the steepest one on the interior of the ship. Of course, there are vertical ladders as well that uh, you will not have to traverse on the tour route. However, you do have this one. This is not on the tour route in terms of you do not have to negotiate this one, but I think it is somewhat accessible. You can see it is outside the post office, so if you really wanted to, you could probably climb up it though, but it is not marked out as a place that you should be, so just use some caution. And our last feature here on second deck, for the moment anyway, a dental office. It still looks pretty run-of-the-mill in terms of what you'd see at a landside dentist's office even today, but obviously you've got an x-ray machine, you have got an exam light, and then you've got the dental chair and then the tool tray. Obviously your support equipment, your sinks, your support for the pneumatic and electric tools, and of course your storage drawer. So yeah, it's a dental office, nothing really to write home about. However, not too far removed from that dental office, we have another one of these absolutely gigantic hatches. What is this? We've seen this before. Yup. Down below is third deck and the first level of the Citadel. This is a six inch armored hatch to fit into the six inch armored deck that forms the top of the armored box. And once you get down there, what do you see? Well, this is the interstitial space, I guess you would call this, between the barbette for turret two and the rest of the ship on third deck. So what you're seeing there is the support for the turret itself. The turret is resting on top of that ring. You can see the hexagonal bolts in there painted yellow, probably from original 40s era paint, I would say. But we're inside the barbette. Remember the barbette is the armored tube, the armored cylindrical structure that the turret sits inside and the barbette physically supports the turret as well and provides all of the ability for the turret to rotate. It rotates on these, it's not a ball race exactly, but it's effectively like a, an extruded cylindrical rail wheel, a train wheel. If you know what they look like, they're a truncated cone shape. Effectively, that's how the turret also rotates inside of a tracked race there. But rather than riding on a rail, you've got these bearings that are stuck between the turret and the side of the barbette, and just the sheer weight of everything keeps them in their circular path. And of course, they need to be lubricated and all, and all that kind of thing. But there's a colossal amount of weight that needs to be absorbed by that structure. However, the entire turret, which the entire structure, remember the turret is far more than just the gun house you can see on the main deck. The whole turret weighs about 2,000 tons. If you could have the turret be its own standalone vessel, it would be about the same size in terms of displacement as a World War II era destroyer. However, that whole turret, that structure that's five or six decks high and weighs 2,000 tons, rotates on just 300 horsepower from a single electrohydraulic motor. Pretty remarkable considering this 80-year-old technology, all analog, all put together by very smart people who understood physics. And now to begin with a little bit of jumping around in terms of where we are on the ship, we just closed up around the barbette for turret number two, which is forward on the ship. Turret two, remember, is the aftmost of the forward main battery turrets. Here we're looking at turret three, at least the turret three gun house and a little bit of the turret three barbette. This is on the fantail, and this is the only main battery turret that is in the after portion of the ship. Jumping around here because there is more that we're going to be seeing on second deck as well as on third deck within the armored citadel and the barbette for turret number two. We were inside the citadel there on third deck looking up in that interstitial space. However, I want to go outside, go topside, go up into the superstructure a little bit into the O2 and O3 levels a little bit, particularly on the O3 level exterior there just aft where we're going to be looking over 
the turret 3 gun house just so you can get a sense of the proportion of these main battery turrets. As I said, the entire assembly that's going down six decks into the ship plus the gun house on top weighs 2,000 tons. It's an enormous structure and they rotate 200 some odd degrees and they've got three 16 inch guns in them that have a rate of fire ideally of about two rounds per minute. It's an enormous structure, enormously complex. However, we get to go inside one of them. We get to go inside turret three, which was a change because typically on the self-guided tour route, you're able to go inside turret number one from the main deck. You can go inside the turret one gun house. You remember from the beginning all of the renovations that were going on to the forward main deck that included the access into turret number one. So to compensate for that, the museum opened up the turret three gun house, which is actually a little bit unique. Turret one, they lost the rangefinder on turret one on all of the Iowas in the 1950s. Turrets two and three retained theirs. So turret three has the rangefinder, and it's my first time seeing one of those rangefinders up close, which was also cool. But we will pick up with a video from the after portion of the main deck on the port side. We'll see a 5-inch mount, and then we'll go inside, we'll go up a couple levels in the superstructure, we'll see some officers berthing, and then we will head right aft on the superstructure. You'll see the helicopter control tower, and then we will be overlooking the gun house for turret number 3, and you'll just see how enormously huge some of these things really are. Operational five inch turret. And back inside here on the 01 level, which they say keep the door closed, but they're not letting you close the door. All right. Okay, makes sense. Yep, more officers. Not bad. No. And two to a room rather than 50. Higher ranking. Yeah. Chief Gunnery Officer. Locked. Yeah. Too bad. We'll be down there a little later, I presume. Yeah. Yeah, that is a museum addition, I'm sure. Oh, no doubt. We gotta go up? Yep. Is there, there was a female head on the ship. I think only because at the very tail end, when you started to have female officers in the Navy, you technically had to be able to accommodate them. But there were never any female enlisted. So we are on the O2 level, the second superstructure level. We are still right aft. Um, this will get us up. I think they want to take us up on the, uh, what are now the missile decks and head forward that way toward the bridge, but okay. I'm not sure. We'll find out. Because yeah. I remember seeing this last time at the tail end of everything. Okay. So they kind of reversed it a little. Yeah, that's what they're doing. So let's see. Back this way is air traffic control. So when the helicopters were coming in, this was how they would direct them, talk them down to the deck. Okay. And then this is the roof of turret three which we didn't go inside. The whole point of us going this way was supposed to go inside. Let's, let's go back. <laughs> yeah, we'll go back. But, so yeah. Iowa, um, the, the class leader of this series, just rotated their turret three a couple of weeks ago. I saw that. Mm-hmm. There are hatches in the main deck that are covered up by the turret when it's in this position. So they figured out how to get it running on shore power so that they could load um, a whole bunch of full weight dummy shells that they want uh, to put on display. But they're going to use all the ship systems to transport them, the rail system and whatnot. So they needed to move the turret to make that happen. And they did it. 
and they're gonna use probably that crane or the one on the other side to do that. Periscope's out the top and armor plate on a roof. What you'll also see in this turret, which you wouldn't have seen in turret one, you see these little ears off to the sides? Mm -hmm. Has its own range finder. All the turrets had that when the ship was built. In the 50s, they said, we don't necessarily need that on all of them. So they took it out from turret one. Turrets two and three kept theirs. And it enables the turrets to operate independently. If you lose everything else, but you still have power to train the turrets and fire the guns, the turrets can do their own range finding. Not as effective as the range finders up top, but better than nothing. So yes, the great irony of having gone up here into the O2 level was that we had forgotten to go inside the gun house for turret 3. That was the whole point of us kind of backtracking a little bit and going to the fantail first because when you end your tour, this is where you end up and this is where you get off of the ship at the end of your day. However, we wanted to do this because we had been up in CEC, which we'll see a little bit later on, and we were talking to one of the docents there, and I had mentioned, you know, a little disappointed that turret one, the gun house was closed. I like it in there. So, well, we opened up turret three, go in there instead. So we went back and uh, we were here, but I had gotten caught up in just looking at some of the other mounts, one of the 40 millimeter Bofors mounts that they have here on the Fantel, the ship, not original to the ship in its 80s commission, but it was reunited with the ship when they opened up as a museum. So we were looking at that. And then also New Jersey, also unique among all the Iowas in that she has all of her original ship's boats still aboard. So we were looking at those as well. And then by the time we got over to where Mount 56 is, that's the five inch mount over there on the port side aft, that's the one that's still active or one of the ones that's still active. We totally forgot about turret three. So now we backtrack back down to the main deck, back to the fantail. We crawl underneath the, uh, what is really the, the back of the gun house, but farther forward on the ship because remember turret three faces aft crawl underneath there, there's a hatch that you crawl up inside and that brings you inside the turret three gun house where we shall go presently. And I should also say as we get into the gun house, I don't screw up the orientation of where we are. I do remember that we are facing aft as we are facing the gun pits and you'll see some of that. But the loading and firing process, I didn't get it entirely wrong, but I imply that there are two powder hoists per gun and two ammunition hoists per gun. That's not the case. There is a single ammunition hoist in terms of being a shell hoist that brings the projectile up into the spanner tray that will then close the gap between the breech and the back of the gun pit where the, where the shell hoist is. And then there is a separate powder hoist and there's one of them per gun. And there is a car that rides loosely in an elevator track and it's hoisted by basically what are fancy chain falls under electric power, of course. And it carries in that lift car, six powder bags and a full service charge. If you remember when we were talking about the gun in the parking lot, a full service charge is six 110 pound bags. So all six bags would be on a single car. They would be loaded three by three. So a hatch on the left side of the gun pit opens, three powder bags roll in across the spanner tray, they get rammed in, and then the car drops a little bit, three more bags roll into the spanner tray, they get rammed in, then the rammer retracts, the spanner tray retracts, the breech is closed, and then the gun is reset to its firing elevation. So that's what happens, but you'll see inside the turret all of that stuff and a lot more. Yep, so one half of it goes out the uh, left side of the turret, right side of the ship, because we're facing backward. Mm -hmm. and of course, complementary on the other side. Back through here are the... Uh, the this is where the guns are, a bit dark in there. I don't know if they let you get back through here. Okay, they got lights on. This is a center gun. So there's the breech. Yeah, you can see the tray in the center. Yep, so that's where the, uh, the shell would come across the tray. Right. And then uh, 
on either side. You see the, uh, the gray panels on either side? That's where the powder would come in. So those doors would pop open. The tray goes down, the shell gets rammed in. Then those doors pop open after the rammer comes back. Powder bags come in, three from each side, and then they get rammed in. Then the, uh, the thing that actually fired the gun, the primer, was actually a, a 30 odd six blank, <laughs> which was hit with a hammer. Really? Yep, or electrically. Yeah. yeah. But um, either way, you could do that. Switch for switching the turret from fire control directors in plot to local control. So you could use your own rangefinder. Mm -hmm. Sprinkler system. Calibrated 922.89. And it's due 922.91. Chip was decommissioned by then. Another periscope, which you can absolutely see through. Yeah, that door is locked. The right gun room. But I see it. But the right gun, yeah, there it is, same deal. In turret one, you could get in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was a little different. You can come through this way if you want. No. And then if you needed to do your own fire control from here, you could with uh, these. Yeah. So um, let's see. This would move the guns? Uh, it would tell the guns where to move. So you could dial in here wind speed in knots, target speed in knots, and then let's say you could do, let's say it's disconnected, I think, initial velocity. So um, you would, later on anyway, you would have a little radar in each turret looking at the muzzles of each gun. So when you fired, you would see what your, uh, what your muzzle velocity was. And then you could put that into the computer as a variable. So it'll tell you where the shot should fall based on your speed, the target speed, the wind, all that kind of stuff. All without electronics. It's all a bunch of gears. Wild, wild stuff. Yeah, there are switches down here to turn that on and off. And there's a hand crank override someplace. So if you lost electrical power, you could still crank it. Yep, that would be it. Yep, actually, it's, it's plotting a solution now. Wild. <laughs> nice. Pretty cool. Except for being cool in here, which is not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Would have been, this must have been a miserable duty station though. Yeah. Because of the heat. You probably weren't in here too much though, right? No. And this is the biggest boar brush. I, I was wondering what that was. Yep, it's a boar brush. You'd stick this down um, from the muzzle and you'd lower it down and then pull it back out. Not how you should clean a gun, but right. <laughs> a gun this big, <laughs> you gotta do something. Underneath the rangefinder. <sighs> yeah. Cool. Watch your, watch your yeah, I see. Cool stuff. So aside from having gotten the loading and firing sequence a little wrong, a couple more clarifications. The primary means of firing the guns in terms of closing the firing circuit, sending that impulse into the breaches, igniting the charges, and then bombs away, that was done electrically. The primer, in terms of the thing that actually ignites the main powder charge, is twofold. Each powder bag has a primer patch woven into one of the sides of the powder bag. The powder itself, it is basically a cordite charge, but each grain of the powder is specifically shaped and then milled down to a specific thickness and then drilled down with holes so that the burn rate of each grain of powder is predictable and consistent. However, it's not volatile enough to where if you put a spark to it or you put flame to it or if you strike it with something, it's going to detonate. So the back of each powder bag had 
a primer charge which was much more volatile. It was another type of gunpowder, basically. And when that took a spark or took a flame, that would ignite, and that would ignite with sufficient force and temperature to ignite the main charge. And that was a cascading effect down all six powder bags, and eventually when all six are lit, that gives enough impulse to send that shell down the barrel and then 20 miles downrange and then some. Beyond that, to initiate the whole sequence, so rather than calling it a primer, we might be able to call it an initiator, was a brass cartridge with its own primer at the back, just like small arms ammunition. However, it wasn't quite a 30-06 cartridge. It was comparable in length and diameter to a 30-06 cartridge, but it had much thicker casing walls to withstand not only its own charge, but to withstand all the back pressure of about 35,000 PSI out of the 16-inch chamber with 660 pounds of powder detonating in there. So you couldn't find one of these primer charges and then put it in your 30-06 chambered M1 Garand, for example. Derived from it for sure, however, not quite interchangeable. Beyond that, the computer in the turret that we're manipulating in here, this is not necessarily a range finder, it's more so to be a range keeper. However, because this is one of the turrets that does have its own range finder, if everything did go to hell and you lost spot up high in the superstructure, that's those Y-shaped structures that are on the, the foremast as well as aft in the superstructure, I'll place in some pictures here of spot too, those are your primary range finders for the main battery. If they go down, you do have the range finders in turrets two and three. They can then operate independently and they would use this computer in order to do that. Your main firing solution though for the main battery under normal conditions would be derived from the range and bearing data that spot, either spot one and two are finding, and then the orientational information from spot one or spot two would be sent down into the citadel into a space called main battery plot. And on the Iowas, you have two main battery plotting groups, one forward and one aft, so yet more redundancy. Main battery plot would then find the targeting solution based on the information given to them by spot. And then, once they plot a solution using the main fire control computer, the Ford Mark 1A fire control computer, which the only working example of which exists here on USS New Jersey, that would then be transmitted to the turrets electrically. The turrets would get the fire control solution, they would train and elevate accordingly, and then all of that stuff would happen. The guns would actually be fired from one of the main battery plotting rooms. If you're firing the guns manually from the turrets, you have lost spot one, spot two, or main battery plot in general, in which case your goose is pretty well cooked. However, that's really the lowdown of what's going on inside and outside with plotting fire. So once a target has been acquired, an adequate firing solution has been found, and you have been given permission to fire, all the guns in all the turrets are loaded, you're ready to engage the target, it's going to look a little bit like this. While we are on the subject of firing the guns, be they the primary or secondary battery, it cannot possibly be overstated just how complicated the problem of naval fire control is. Remember, this ship was designed in the late 1930s, laid down in 1940, launched in 1942, commissioned in 1943. Everything on this ship was conceived and designed and manufactured and put into service with the idea that it would be an entirely analog and manual system, meaning that all of the elements of fire control in terms of acquiring an enemy target, gaining a bearing to that target, ranging that target, translating that range and bearing information into a fire solution, was going to be based on line of sight optical techniques. In the superstructure of the ship, look in the gray areas in this image, you will see the large foremast, not the black tripod mast, that's a 1980s edition, the mast immediately before and below that. 
on top of that gray foremast is spot one. That is the primary fire control director for the main battery, the 16 inch guns. That is an optical device. On either end of the cylindrical portion of that director are lenses, which then feed into prisms, which make two images converge into one, and then the operator inside the director will be looking at those images and he will be attempting to superimpose one image on top of the other by making fine adjustments in the optics of that director. Every adjustment that the director operator makes translates into coordinates that are then electrically sent down to main battery plot and entered into the fire control computers, the Ford Mark 1A computers, as variables from which the computers will now calculate based on other information being fed into them from the ship systems themselves, such as the ship's speed, the ship's bearing, wind direction, because we are going to be making weather observations the entire time via weather observation equipment as well as just guys out on deck. Ambient temperature is a factor. Barometric pressure is a factor. Remember, these ships also carried spotter aircraft. Where the helipad is nowadays on New Jersey, that didn't exist in World War II. In its place were catapults for float planes. The float planes would be sent up, and they would not only do spotting in terms of finding targets for the main battery to engage, but they would also be taking weather observations of temperatures, pressures, and winds aloft. Because you're aiming at a target that might be over 20 miles away. You cannot see it from the level of the main deck. Sometimes you can't even see it from where the main battery directors are, although that would effectively be pushing any target out of any meaningful range. However, given weather conditions, given barometric pressures, miraging effects on the horizon, you may or may not be able to see your target clearly at all beyond just being able to say, hey, it's there. Not only that, but because these shells, when they're arcing from a 45 degree launch angle, they are going to be traveling for over 20 miles. They may ascend to well beyond 10,000 feet altitude. The winds aloft at 10,000 feet may be wildly different from what they are at sea level, as may be the pressures and temperatures. All of those things are going to affect the flight of your shells, and you have no way of directly observing those conditions until you actually shoot or until you have spotting aircraft there who are going to radio back corrections into main battery plot. So, not only are you shooting over the horizon in many cases, optically, but you're also counting on the input from forward observers in airplanes, forward observers in other ships in your group, and physically spotting your fall of shot through binoculars from up in the fire control directors. And you have to make sure that every shot you take is going to be a hit, or going to be close to a hit on your enemy ship because the enemy battleship is doing exactly the same thing you're doing and you're playing the statistical game of if I lob nine shells out down range in his general direction I've got a one in nine chance of hitting him on every salvo if I'm accurate to within 500 feet or so given the typical length of an enemy ship that you might be engaging if he is half as accurate as us well maybe he has a one in every three salvo chance of hitting us. Could be any one of the next three salvos he fires. So you see, one hit in the right spot is going to cripple our ship. One hit in the right spot is going to cripple his. We just need to be that incrementally better at solving this fire control problem than he is. Which is why you have the tremendous amount of redundancy in every system on this ship, particularly the ones that are surrounding the operation of the main battery. You've got two main fire control directors up in the superstructure. Two of the three turrets as the ship currently exists have their own range finders and range keepers and they can plot their own primitive firing solutions if they have to. Two main battery plotting rooms. You have got four directors for the secondary battery which could be tied in to direct the main battery if all hell breaks loose and vice versa. As built, you've got 10 secondary battery 5-inch 38 caliber mounts. Everything about this ship is designed to give you the best statistical probability of hitting your target before the enemy hits his target. And it's the most complicated thing that you could ever imagine to do because, taking out all of the other variables, you're trying to aim a gun at a moving target when you yourself are on a moving platform that's moving in three dimensions. 
And by the way, you're not entirely sure which direction your target is moving. So just consider all of that, and then remember engagements such as USS Massachusetts, a South Dakota-class battleship engaging the French battleship Jean Bart from a distance of about 15 to 17 miles. Jean Bart wasn't even moving. Remember the night action at Guadalcanal with the battleships South Dakota and Washington engaging the Japanese battleship Kirishima and Washington absolutely blew Kirishima out of the water before they could blow South Dakota out of the water. And they did it at night before radar was really radar. So just imagine that for a moment. Leaving the world of big guns and fire control behind, though we're not entirely done with it yet, we continue forward now on the O2 level, that is the second level of the superstructure. We pass the TV studio where the ship's closed circuit television was produced, particularly in the 1980s. It's still kitted out as a 1980s TV studio. Kind of cool, but you can't go in. You can just look in through the door. And the major feature on the O2 level is the Combat Engagement Center, or CEC. CEC is decked out as it would have appeared in the 1980s. Basically, it is a whole bunch of control consoles for the various radar arrays, as well as the Harpoon and Tomahawk missile launch consoles, including what is a recent discovery of the missile launch consoles for the nuclear-tipped Tomahawks and the keys that go along with them. That was not quite a thing when we did this tour here in August of 2023. However, they had made the discovery of finding the missile launch keys by that point. The museum had done. However, the Tomahawk launch console in there has a nuclear permission to fire slot, two key slots actually, that would have to be engaged with the correct keys and turned at the correct time in order to enable the launch of a nuclear tip Tomahawk, which the Navy will not confirm or deny that any of the Iowa class battleships ever carried. However, the presence of the permission to fire keys, not just the key slots on the consoles, but the keys that were found on board the ship by the museum curators, that would seem to indicate that, yes, the ship actually was armed with nuclear tomahawks in the 1980s. However, you'll see that and a whole lot more in CEC. Didn't take any pictures in there because the lighting's pretty bad. And honestly, it's a whole bunch of computer screens and things that you pretty well can figure out what they look like. And plus, I want you to go see the ship for yourself, so I'm not going to show you everything anyway. However, once you are done in CEC and playing around with the missile launch consoles and pretending to nuke Philadelphia, you then ascend another ladder way to the O3 level, which is where we find ourselves in this sequence of images. The main feature on the O3 level is the Admiral's Flag Bridge, and this is the spot not where the ship would be conned from, but where the Admiral... In other words, the admiral who is flying his flag over the USS New Jersey as leader of whatever battle group that New Jersey happened to be in, this is where the admiral would be overlooking the sea space around the ship, taking a look at everything going on in the battle group, and of course being in communication with not only everybody aboard New Jersey in this case, but everybody else in group via the menagerie of communications equipment here. Some of this equipment is original from 1942. Some of this equipment has been retrofitted all the way through the late 1980s. It's a real hodgepodge of old and new in these spaces, but they didn't tend to delete things. They only tended to add, and the reason for that is, once again, redundancy. It is also most likely in this spot where Admiral William Halsey, who was commander of Task Force 34 during the Battle of Leyte Gulf, particularly on October 25th, 1944, received telegram from Admiral the Fleet Chester Nimitz. Halsey had taken New Jersey and her battle group out to the northeast trying to pursue a, what, what Halsey thought was a group of Japanese aircraft carriers that turned out just to be a decoy. Nimitz realized that Halsey, New Jersey, and the rest of the group were gone, and he was wondering where the hell they were. So it was most likely in this space where Halsey received the telegram from Admiral Nimitz, which read, Where is, repeat, where is Task Force 34? The world wonders. 
Halsey received that message, and the story goes he threw his cap on the deck and stomped on it like a toddler. I don't know how true that story is. However, someone as aggressive as Halsey, Bull Halsey as his name informally was known in his days in the Navy, he probably didn't take so kindly to the last part of that message, the world wonders, as in, have you deserted your men in battle, Halsey? Probably that's how he interpreted that. Was that intended on the part of Admiral Nimitz, or was that part of the security padding that would have surrounded messages like that for fear that they would be decrypted and then read out by the enemy? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Either way, it is now one of the most famous telegrams ever sent and probably the most famous message ever received by USS New Jersey. That happened right here. Going up one level from the Admiral's Bridge is the 04 level and the Navigation Bridge. This is the navigational nerve center for an Iowa-class battleship, or really any sort of ship. However, here on the Iowas, the 04 Con was designed to be Battle Con. This is where the ship would be commanded from in combat. In practice, it ended up being where the ship was conned from most of the time anyway. There are four steering positions on Iowa and New Jersey. Wisconsin and Missouri delete one of them. However, this ended up being where the ship was commanded from at all times, in peace as well as in combat. However, the number one feature that we're going to see here on the navigation bridge is the aptly named Conning Tower, which is armored to the tune of 17.3 inches of armor plate. It is the single thickest single plate casting of armor anywhere on an Iowa-class battleship. It is armored against, theoretically, the primary armament of an Iowa-class battleship, given the rule that one inch of armor plate will stop one inch of projectile. That means that, theoretically, the conning tower could take a hit from a 16-inch gun and the crew inside and all the equipment inside would survive. Is that true? Nobody knows. Thank heavens they don't know. However, that is what you'll see here on the navigation bridge. You'll also see a few other features on the navigation bridge, but you will note that this space probably doesn't look all that much like what you might be expecting to see on the navigation bridge of a big ship in that there's no big ship's wheel, there are no big radar display screens, and there's really not all that much space up here. This area around the conning tower that we're going to be walking through was not originally there when the Iowas were built. Iowa and New Jersey both launched with open bridges. The conning tower was always there. That's part of the armored citadel, technically speaking. But the enclosed catwalk around the conning tower, that was something that was added in the middle of World War II to Iowa and New Jersey. Wisconsin and Missouri, they launched with this modification because they thought it would be quite useful. However, that means that there's not all that much room around the conning tower, so it's one of those tighter spaces that you're going to see on the ship. However, it is certainly one of the coolest. decoys, countermeasures, voice tube. Counting tower. Meant to be battle con, but it became primary con because uh, there's a couple other steering positions, including one way up top on a 08 level that nobody wanted to climb to. So <laughs> this became it. How do you see? You don't. You got little view slits, and that's about it, which are really meant just for um, ventilation. Mm. But you've got periscopes, and of course, you've got people outside. Mm. Um, this is the, yeah, this is the single thickest single piece of armor on a ship, 17.3 inches. So this is meant to take a direct hit from its own guns, in theory. Would you have lived? Eh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no. And, and um, the other thing was, this was not originally enclosed like this. This all would have been open, and the first enclosed spot would have been the conning tower. Mm -hmm. So those slits kind of make a little bit more sense for ventilation, but they enclosed it just for weather. 
and um, Iowa and New Jersey launched like that with the open bridge. Missouri and Wisconsin were never open. They had this built um, by default. So little things they learned along the way. Outer side of the conning tower. Yeah. There also would have been glass in here so that um, later on for nuclear biological stuff, it would have had basically the ability to seal that completely, in theory. In theory. Would it have worked? <laughs> Thankfully, we never found out. And you'd be pretty well protected. So yeah. Flats. Yeah, you would be. But from the concussion of everything, who knows? Yeah, true. This door is, I think, 23, 2400 pounds. It has its own hydraulic system to close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very still in there. <laughs> There's a communications equipment. That's the horn. <laughs> cool. Shark house. Captain's at sea cabin. That's the one that has the uh, okay. the door. Yep, which makes more sense because you, you'd want to be to be able to get up to the bridge. So there it was. Deck is a bit thin there. Yeah. There, not everything on a ship is in perfect condition, but yeah, yeah. We will go up. Rudder indicators. Cool. So the navigation bridge on an Iowa class battleship, does it look the way that you thought it would? Probably not. Bridges in terms of traditional nautical engineering, they were open structures so that you would have an unobstructed view to the horizon and of course all around the ship at all points in between. However, as technology increased, ships started to go faster. And, more importantly, you started to get better technology in terms of navigational aids. Obviously, lighting, so you could have some lights on in the fog, so perhaps you don't need to be up high and outside in the elements all the time to see quite as far. And now, really, in the era that New Jersey is built, you're going from line-of-sight navigation and star charts and things like that to having things like radar and radio. So the need to have an all open navigation bridge is quickly diminishing. And we see that in the design of New Jersey herself, initially launched with an open style navigation bridge without this enclosed catwalk structure around the conning tower. But by 1944, New Jersey had her first enclosed bridge, which was a circular structure, outwardly looks similar to the one that exists today, but it was semicircular rather than this squared off arrangement. However, by 1945, by the end of the war, this structure that we're in now existed, and this obviously remained for the remainder of New Jersey's active service career, and of course it's maintained today as a feature of the ship. It's been on the ship for far longer than it ever was not on the ship, so it is part of the original fabric of the ship, particularly going back to the World War II era, so it makes sense to maintain it as it is. Beyond that, though, that conning tower, 17.3 inches thick, theoretically could resist a hit from a 16-inch shell, would not want to be inside in that particular circumstance, because even if you survived the concussion effects, you would probably be deaf, and who knows what other internal damage would be done from that sudden pressure difference going through the conning tower. So, don't want to find out. Thankfully, we never did find out, but you can see in there, you've got a control set for... Sending commands to the rudder, you have got telegraphs for sending commands down into the fire and engine rooms. None of those controls do anything in terms of 
directly influencing behavior of the ship. The wheel does because that is sending an electric signal down to the hydraulic motors in after steering where the rudder posts actually are. But beyond that, when you are sending an engine command down into the engine rooms, you are telling the men down in the engine rooms and the boiler rooms how to adjust their settings to make the engines give you the performance that you're asking for. You're not directly controlling, say, a throttle valve, for example. Those don't really exist on a ship like this. Beyond that, though, just a ton of communications equipment, signaling equipment in terms of exterior lights. You have the launch console for the various countermeasures, particularly the Surbach launchers, the chaff launchers. You've got the horn right here, which is another signaling device meant for closer in or even for signaling to guys on your deck. And then just a mess of wiring, more telephones for internal communications. You have got battle telephone jacks there, some safety equipment. You've got a small chart table here on the after starboard side of the navigation bridge. Then when we go back here into the chart house itself, this is where all of your quartermasters would be doing their work, updating charts, pulling the next set of charts out that they're going to be using depending on where we're going. And then of course heading out to the starboard side after bridge wing where we've got another couple of rudder position indicator repeaters, couple of speed repeaters, and then of course a chair for either the uh, CO, XO, or maybe the Admiral if he's aboard to sit out here on a nice day. So lots of stuff to see on the navigation bridge, lots of stuff to see in the conning tower itself. If you were uh, able to go in there, you might be able to go in there on a guided tour, but really a very interesting place on in Iowa. And just to button up this point about the evolution of the navigation bridge on New Jersey, I've got some historical photographs to take a look at. First of all, this is a picture of New Jersey from 1943, either immediately before or immediately after her commissioning, because the National Archives say that this photograph originates from the Philadelphia Naval Yard, and that's where the ship was built, launched, and commissioned. However, we can see, yep, this is absolutely New Jersey. We've got the whole number 62 there. However, she looks a little bit more trimmed out and a little bit more svelte than she does today and even than she would look later on in World War II. Most of the anti-aircraft armament appears not to have been added, at least those mounts that would eventually be added to the main deck. Uh, neither does she have the little pulpit, the... Uh, shield that is over top of the bullnose just below the uh, forward flagstaff. And as we start to move aft, we can see there are our forward main battery turrets, turrets one and two. They still look pretty much the same with the exception of turret two having this quad 40 Bofors mount on top, which has since been deleted. And then we get into the center superstructure where we can clearly see we've got the 04 and 05 levels, the navigation bridge here, and the armored conning tower. However, we have no enclosure of any kind around the conning tower. You can see we have got the viewports here on the 04 level, and we've even got some people up there for scale. The viewports that we were looking in through, we can see those, and it does appear if we zoom all the way in, it appears that the port side door to the conning tower is open in this image as well. That's cool. But you can see the viewports. The glass to cover over the viewports apparently is in place, at least here on the 04 level. And then up one level to what is now the 05 level, we can see further viewports. This is the upper level of the conning tower, which has a different purpose altogether. It's not associated with navigation or command of the ship, but we can go inside there on the museum tour today, and we will go inside there in a moment. But here, clearly, you can see the navigation bridge is totally open. You can see here where... Uh, the aftmost man here on uh, the 04 level is standing. That is about where we were looking prior on the external bridge wings, the port side wing. However, no enclosure whatsoever here around the armored conning tower here on New Jersey in this roughly May 1943 image. And this next shot, this is also showing New Jersey at around the same time, probably mid to late 1943, uh, probably after her shakedown cruise, because this image was labeled as coming from Hampton Roads, Virginia. You can see hull number 62. We can see that the jack is raised on the forepeak of the bow. So that is clearly uh, signifying that this is a commissioned U.S. Navy ship. And you can see that we have got that little pulpit, raised platform, and shield 
around the extreme four peak of the bow here at the prow of the ship. That's cool. There are the hoss pipes for the anchor chains, and you can see that they are exiting here where the anchors are. The port anchor is currently deployed. That's cool. And it looks like the center anchor is also down. Very nice. And then as we move aft on the ship, we still do not have any uh, anti-aircraft mounts here, at least not where they currently are. We can see that we have got hatches here on either side on the main deck, and then below that we would have our uh, second deck berthing compartment, really. Obviously we have got our anchor windlass room immediately below the deck hardware here for the anchor chains and then the hatches that take you down below. That's real cool. You can identify these structures pretty easily. Here is our breakwater around uh, turret one, just forward of turret one, and then turret two with the quad 40 Bofors mount there. Trained a little bit to port, very nice. Range finders on turret two, those are still there. Range finders on turret one are no longer. Here's the O1 level, the doors that lead into the officer's ward room. And then as we head up, there's the armored conning tower and the O4 level of the bridge. Again, uh, completely open. Down on the O3 level, this is the Admiral's Bridge. You can see the windows there. So this was always enclosed. And of course, it's enclosed as well on the starboard side that we can't quite see. However, um, that's really cool. And I did not mean to uh, advance to the next video there. <laughs> However, uh, some gratuitous 16-inch fire once again for you. But clearly, you can see that we have got no enclosure whatsoever around the conning tower on the O4 level. And on this next shot from about 1944, clearly we are at sea and we are well forward on the forecastle deck. We zoom in here, obviously anchor chains and uh, windless hardware as well. If we continue to look aft, we've got ourselves those gun tubs. We can still see the outlines of these gun tubs on the main deck today, but these are 20 millimeter Arlequin mounts. So they've been added. Additionally, you can see we have got 40 millimeter mounts as well. You can also see the outlines of these gun tubs on the main deck these days. Turret one with the directors here, just forward of turret one for those 40 millimeter mounts. Turret two with another quad 40 mount on top. But then beyond turret two, look at this. We have got an enclosure around the bridge. However, this is not the enclosure that you will still find aboard New Jersey today. This is the round bridge. New Jersey only kept this for about 12 to 14 months. It's a very brief period in the ship's history. And New Jersey was the only of the Iowas to have this particular style of bridge enclosure. So this is a surefire way to identify New Jersey in historic photos like this because there's no other Iowa that had a bridge that looked anything like this. And this much closer, much higher resolution image, we can see we've got turret two trained over to the port side in an over the shoulder configuration. This shot is showing us just above the level of the main deck. There is the entrance into the officer's wardroom. And then we have got uh, the uh, O1 and O2 levels of the conning tower, inaccessible really. The O3 level here is the flag bridge. And then the O4 level, you can see very clearly the circular enclosure around the O4 level conning tower. We can see that uh, they appear to have the door open once again. And we have got all the windows around in this enclosure. It looks very Art Deco, I've got to say, but it is a little off-putting when you consider what the ship currently looks like. Also, you can see that the ship is sprouting yet more radar. We have got radar here over one of the directors. This is the Sky One director for the secondary battery, the 5 inch 38s. And then we have got this radar over top of the armored conning tower on the O5 level. What is this all about? We're going to see what that's all about in a moment, but we have got a gun director here for the 5 inch battery. And then we have got a similar looking radar on top of the conning tower. Is this for navigation? No, it's not. What is it for? Well, you're just going to have to find out. However, on either side here, we have got more quad 40 mounts. And we have got this light. This is, I believe it's a signal light. It is still on the ship today. 
and uh, I have swiveled this around. I don't remember if it has the diaphragm in it or not for sending Morse, but uh, it is a light and it probably still works, but you can slew it around if you do. Remember to stop at that uh, port bridge wing here on your self-guided tour. Real, real cool. Also real cool to see turret two slewed over to port like this. Uh, they're probably doing some loading operations so that they need access to some of the hatches around the main deck there, around the base of turret two. But yes, that is some cool stuff. At any rate, as we have already seen the navigation bridge, we will be heading up one more level in the superstructure, up to the 05 level. The 05 level allows us to get a little bit more up close and personal to this, the armored conning tower. Here on the 04 level, this is basically primary con. You can see the control console in there with the helm, with the engine order telegraphs, the periscopes, and all of that stuff. However, there is one more level of the armored conning tower, and it's not a conning station, per se. The interior of the conning tower on the O5 level is not a conning station at all. However, the exterior deck on the O5 level is actually a conning station. Although not in the way you may expect in that there are no direct controls up there. However, you'll see what I mean in a moment. First though, we get to go inside the armored conning tower on the O5 level. I think we can go in here. We're at the uh, top of the armored conning tower. Yeah. Well, this is quantifiably the safest place I will ever be. I am inside 17.3 inches of armor plate cast as a single piece. <laughs> Periscopes at the top still work. And there's the bullseye. It's cool. Yeah. Right, so up until this point, we have been referring to the conning tower, first of all, as the place where the ship can be commanded from, and that's absolutely true, up to the 04 level, and we've also been referring to fire control for the main battery as spot 1 and spot 2. What this 05 level conning tower position actually is though, it's not a conning position, but it's another spot position. This is spot three. This is a radar driven fire control station for the main battery. That radar mast on top of the conning tower in that 1944 photograph of New Jersey, that's what this was for. The scopes in here, Periscopes, obviously, for optical line of sight ranging, but you have got radar scopes in here, radar repeaters, which are then going to be able to use the newfound technology of radar to find range and bearing information to targets of interest. You can then, via all of the selectors in here in terms of your indicators and your cross-connect switches, send that information down into main battery plot who will then find a targeting solution with the fire control computers, probably corroborating the data that you're giving them with the data from spot one and two. However, this is spot three. This is an auxiliary, technically speaking, fire control station for the main battery. However, it is a radar fire control director. Really cool. It's in the top of the armored conning tower, which means that you can be inside 17.3 inches of plate armor, should you wish, aboard USS New Jersey. And that's a really cool feeling. Returning to one of the models of an Iowa-class battleship that I have now, just to show you where we are. Again, this is showing Missouri in her 1944 configuration, so things are a little bit different, but still pretty much enough correspondence so that you could find your way. Here's the 04 bridge with the windows around it. Missouri launched with this configuration of bridge, so just like New Jersey looks like nowadays. And then up on the 05 level, this is the top of the armored conning tower. And then behind that, we have got our Sky One director for the uh, secondary battery, the five inch guns. Also immediately between the conning tower and the Sky One director, we have got a director for the 40 millimeter guns, which you can see here on either side of the superstructure. However, just around the top of the conning tower, we can see that we have got these square and circular protrusions there. That's what this 1-700 scale model is doing its best to uh, represent 
some of the repeater sets that you'll see up here in terms of what's our speed, what are the engines doing, what's our rudder angle, things like that. And we're going to see what those things actually look like and we're going to be able to manipulate them in a moment here from the 05 level. Also, you get a really commanding view from up here. Remember, you no longer have this 40 millimeter mount on top of turret number two, which means that you have an unobstructed view all the way ahead, all the way out to the very bow of the ship and then all the way up to the Ben Franklin Bridge where New Jersey is sitting today. So the 05 level looks really cool. We're gonna take a look at what you can see up here. Also up here though, and you won't see this on the model that I've got here, you will also see very stark indications of New Jersey's life after the World War II era. Remember, New Jersey was commissioned in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and then actions in the 1980s in the Mediterranean and Persian Gulf. So the ship lived a very long life and technology absolutely exploded in the time that New Jersey was an active ship, meaning that all of the anti-aircraft mounts that you see here on this model of Missouri, as well as in the historical photos of New Jersey, they are now pretty much all gone and they have been replaced with very sophisticated technology by way of countermeasures in terms of flare and chaff launchers and offensive weapons such as harpoon and tomahawk missile launchers. So you're going to see a whole bunch of that stuff as well. The midship superstructure is probably the single most changed area on board an Iowa class battleship nowadays compared to what they looked like when they were first brought into commission. So the 05 level, we spent quite a few minutes up here taking a look around because there's quite a bit to see. Yep, 05 level. Here are the wind antennas that are 30 feet, I think. Yeah. So we're standing right on top of the windows of the uh, of the main bridge, basically. And repeaters for uh, what the engines are actually doing. Shaft RPM on all four props. Rudder angle. And then you could give your, uh, you could give your tiller commands basically here to your helmsman who's most likely down below you there. And then you could dial in whatever course you want. We're headed roughly east, so let's match it up. Or are we headed roughly north, actually? Yeah, we're more north than east, whatever. Pretty cool. Yeah. And this was not open last time we were here. Not, not up this high. Yeah. Lights, engine order telegraphs. Small arms box maybe for problem crew members. These boxes, I think they have something to do with the, um, the 80s electronics, the countermeasures, jamming the missiles, that sort of thing. But this is one of the directors, they called these um, Sky. So the bigger ones are called Spot for the main battery. These are for the secondary battery called Sky. And um, these were um, optical range finders with radar augmentation and they could, be, they could be tied in with the fire control system to work with any of the guns, but they were primarily meant for the secondary battery. And there are four of these scattered around on either, on either side as well as fore and aft. So see whiz. All the way up. It is a nice breeze up here. Let's see if they've mostly dogged it shut. Oh well. Lots of very expensive rounds. That 
that's a step. <laughs> Another, yeah, another sky director and then the chaff. The Surbach mortars. So if you got a missile coming at you, these pop off and hopefully confuse it long enough so that it misses. Um, the last time one of these ships was hit was actually friendly fire. Um, in the Persian Gulf, I think it was Missouri that was hit by a British destroyer or cruiser or whatever that was in the battle group. Um, the Iraqis had launched a missile and it was coming in their general direction, but it didn't really have a lock on anything. So Missouri fired chaff and then the British ship fired on Missouri's chaff <laughs> and hit Missouri. Oops. Nobody was hurt, but there are still bullet holes in Missouri from it. Yeah. Forward funnel and forward aft superstructure. Tomahawk box launchers, funnel number two. Spot two is behind that. Yep. They got one of the launchers open. They, uh, the funnel caps, um, they recently did a bunch of work on them. They had all rusted through, so they uh, put new steel up there, painted everything. Looks good now. And this whole deck, this would not have been here when the ship was commissioned. Um, all of this stuff was added in the 80s. So all of this would have been 20 and 40 millimeter anti-aircraft mounts in those days. So some of the models you saw downstairs will show that so yes yeah, so a look around the 05 level as you can see there is a lot going on up here and there is a great clash of old and new here we've got some shots that i took in 2022 up here on the 05 level here you can clearly see the sky one director and then the center fire control tower your principal part of the superstructure and then we turn around and we look forward we've headed a little bit farther aft but looking forward over the bow just the bottom of one of the sea whiz mounts visible there sea whiz that is close in weapons system and this particular type of sea whiz is called the phalanx basically that is a chain gun and it's got multiple barrels that revolve so it's a chain gun gatling gun sort of setup and what that does is it is an incredibly high rate of fire close-in weapon system designed to defend against incoming aircraft and or missiles so all of those 20 and 40 millimeter mounts that the ship originally was equipped with when she was first commissioned all the way back in 1943 that was all replaced eventually with that sea whiz armament and there are four sea whiz mounts in the upper superstructure of new jersey today that replaces all of those manned mounts. It is a completely autonomous system. It will acquire, track, and then engage targets as necessary. Again, mostly designed to engage aerial targets, be they aircraft or missiles. However, I suppose in a pinch, they also could be used for close-in surface engagements, but I don't know if that system was designed with that eventuality in mind or if it was ever tested as such. Other items that are visible here on what are now the missile decks. We have got the harpoon launchers. Those are the cylindrical structures that you can see in groups of four. They have got red caps on either end. Inside there, the harpoon missiles would have been stored and then would have been launched from these tubes. The harpoon system is primarily an anti-ship weapon system and it is a short to medium range missile. So. Engaging surface targets beyond the range of your main battery guns, that's uh, what the Harpoon is designed for. And really, the Harpoon was designed for use on cruisers, not battleships. But it just so happened that in the 1980s, when the Navy decided to reactivate all the Iowas, hey, we've got this spare real estate, let's put Harpoons on them too. Also, you will see on what are now the missile decks, and again, back when the ship was originally commissioned, these would have been areas where 40 and 20 millimeter anti-aircraft mounts would be. 
you will see these rectangular boxes, and they are aptly named Armored Box Launchers. Inside the Armored Box Launcher, you will find four launch tubes for Tomahawk missiles, and these missiles were the ones that could be used in an anti-surface, anti-land, or long-range nuclear role. Now, again, the Navy will never confirm nor deny whether or not New Jersey ever carried nuclear weapons on board. However, the presence of the launch consoles, including a nuclear launch console up in CEC, would strongly suggest that at some point New Jersey absolutely was equipped with nuclear warheads for the Tomahawks. However, you can see the armored box launchers, one of which is open here with a warhead sticking out the top as if the missile were right at the beginning of its launch sequence you get a sense of what that would look like. And of course, you wouldn't want to be standing anywhere near these things if they were being fired because the harpoons, you could be directly in the exhaust plume of the, of the rocket, and the tomahawks, although you're probably not going to get behind the box launcher, you're going to be well deaf if not suffering radiant burns from the rocket plume as it's flying out. So, yeah, this is a cool place. Totally not original to the ship, so this is one of the places where you can pretty much forget that you're on an 80-year-old ship and perhaps you're on something far more contemporary because most of this equipment is still contemporaneous with the modern Navy. But this is what it looks like today here in about amidships on the 05 level of New Jersey. And a couple little Easter eggs that I spotted here on the 05 level. This is on the starboard side of the fire control tower, the large pyramidal foremast in the forward superstructure, and this warning placard is just letting you know that if that radar is active, you are going to be exposed to radio frequency radiation, and it tells you a radio frequency hazard exists in this area defined by red lines, and there are red lines on the deck in various places, not only ones put there by the museum to show where the tour route is, but also red lines that are original to the ship, at least in the 1980s configuration that she still mostly is in. And it's letting you know to keep moving, because as unlikely as it may be, there is a non-zero chance of you being microwaved if you stand below an active radar for a little bit too long. So keep it moving, nothing to see here. It's effectively what this little diamond-shaped placard is telling you. Also in this area, a little bit farther aft of this in the area of the forward funnel, I found an unlocked door, and what do you do if you find an unlocked door on a battleship? You open it, of course, and inside I found this big empty space that is partially being used as a broom closet nowadays, but also inside here. This is, believe it or not, the casing for the uptakes, the exhaust stack for the boilers, at least in the uh, forward parts of the ship, because this is the forward funnel and we do have an aft funnel as well on the Iowa. So this space, not on a tour route, not open to the public, but was unsecured that day. So yeah, I got to get up close and personal with the uptake casing inside what is really the outer cladding of the superstructure. It's not really structural here and nothing here is armored either for the most part. And uh, you get to see a part of the ship that most people probably haven't seen unless you happen to work uh, on an Iowa today in their museum careers or if you happen to be former crew of an Iowa. In either case, you would not want to be here when the ship is at all powered up because I'd imagine this would be mighty hot because all of the exhaust from the fires, the oil fires that are turning all of that boiler feed water into steam for powering literally everything on the ship, that exhaust has to go someplace, so all of the empty space around this casing, and there are also a couple of struts on either side providing some structural support to this, and also most likely allowing for the thermal expansion and contraction of this casing as things get hotter or cooler, depending on what sort of load the ship is under. Very interesting to see. Obviously, there is some access points in here because sometimes maintenance would have to occur in this space. However, for the most part, this is pretty much an empty void on a battleship. On a ship where everything has an explicit purpose, even the empty space must have an explicit purpose as well. Again, I think for thermal control. But yeah, an area on the ship that you probably won't see anywhere else unless you too happen to find this door unlocked and take a peek inside. 
Another point of interest up here is Spot 2. This is the armored tube supporting the rangefinder and radar for Spot 2. Again, another rangefinder and fire control director for the 16-inch battery. If there is any obscure location on the ship, not on the Toroth, that I would really like to get into, this is one of them because it's, it's just a weird-looking structure, but I know that uh, it probably still works if you could rotate this. Um, you'd be able to train this 360 degrees and look through the rangefinder. You can see the two ends of it there. Again, those are sending the images that it's gathering through the lenses into prisms, and then you've got to superimpose two images into one to find a range. But uh, I would like to be able to go inside there. Maybe someday I'd be able, but not able today, apparently. However, also you will see here some indications of the ship in its museum service rather than any other period of its active history you see here just to the right and below spot two you will see we've got some air handling equipment there that's not original to the ship that is an aftermarket air conditioning unit added to keep things cool you can see that uh, the day that I was there is pretty hot, fairly humid. It's pulling a lot of humidity out of the atmosphere, meaning it's just draining all of this water directly onto the deck. And you can see some of the implications of that as that's been going on over time. Not the best. Clearly, there will have to be some work done in the near future on this part of the deck. However, it's just part of the game. It's a ship. It's in the water. It's always going to be wet. Wetness and steel don't particularly mix very well, so it's a never-ending game of find the corrosion, remove the corrosion, paint over the corrosion, find the corrosion, remove the corrosion, paint over the corrosion, repeat forever and ever. So, yep, just one more thing that you'll see here up around what are now the missile decks. Descending from the after portion of the 05 and 04 levels down to the 01 level, that's to say one level above the main deck, we are suddenly confronted with this plaque, obviously commemorating the United States Marine Corps. This is a Navy ship. What are the Marines doing here? Well, the Marines played a very important role aboard this ship and many others. They, first of all, did security, but they also manned many gun mounts, including this tremendous gun mount. What is this other turret? Well, this is one of the 5-inch 38 caliber twin mounts that used to absolutely pepper this ship on both port and starboard sides. Somewhat reduced in terms of their disposition nowadays because the Iowas, they all launched with 10 of these. Today, they retain only six. However, these 5-inch 38 mounts, they are indicative of probably the most used workhorse naval gun in the World War II period for the United States. This gun was the multi-purpose secondary battery that could engage surface, land, or air targets. The barrels could train up to 85 degrees elevation. They had a maximum effective range of about 10 miles, and they could fire high explosive, they could fire armor piercing, and they could fire fused chaff and flak ammunition for anti-air engagement. So a very versatile gun. They are all manually loaded, just like the 16-inch guns, but it's a little bit easier of a process because you have got a 5-inch shell that weighs 50 to 60 pounds rather than a 16-inch shell that weighs up to 2,700 pounds. So you'd have a lot of men inside each of these turrets, and they would be handling the powder and the shells. They'd be loading them into the breaches of the guns and then firing them just like you would for the big 16-inch battery, but it all happens a lot faster. Rate of fire on these, I think, could exceed 10 rounds per minute, maybe even up to 15 rounds per minute if you had a particularly ambitious crew inside the mount. But we get to go inside this 5-inch 38 mount, and here's what that looks like. 5-inch turret. Five inch thirty eight. Pretty cool. So these would have had an effective range of around ten miles or so. And then let's see. Shell hoists. So these are these are dummy rounds because they're blue. But these uh, hoists were able to set the fuses as well so they could just hoist them up 
put them in the breech of the gun and they're ready to go. Powder was coming up from here, from these hoists, this shell and powder separate. And then down the other side, they would be throwing the powder down a scuttle into whatever compartments below this, which could be anything. So eventually you would have these powder canisters just littering the deck because the, the guns didn't, they didn't eject like that. So you had to then pull everything out again. Back here is uh, where you get your turret officer sitting and you could aim the gun manually from here if you needed to. You would get um, orders from plot and then you would just uh, match up period correct CPR instructions too. Let's see, can't read that. Cool. A little bit bigger than my uh, 22 rifle. Same principle though, which is the wild thing. That light is on, whatever that means. It means that we still have power in here <laughs> beyond the uh, light fixture. There we go. This is keeping you from closing the breach. Probably smart, because people like me would know how to do that. Rammer drained, 8492. Period, correct mothballing stuff. Cool. So that's the 538 turret. Not a very big space, and of course you have got two barrels that elevate in unison, but they fire independently, so they are not necessarily synchronized in terms of their loading and firing. Of course, everything is duplicated. You've got two powder hoists, two shell hoists, and then of course you've got two breaches because you've got two guns in here. You may have up to 15 men in this turret at any time, though, plus whoever is sitting in that seat over on the left-hand side training the turret around. So you've got a lot of bodies in here, and you've got a lot of movement, and of course you're dealing with explosives both in the shells as well as the powder propelling those shells. So everything had to be very well choreographed around here because guys could only get in each other's way which means that injuries, I'd imagine, were fairly common in these 538 mounts. So things had to be coordinated, they had to be well practiced, and of course, when it counted, everything had to go off without a hitch because really, these were your primary means of defense against anybody who was really approaching your ship because as good as your 16-inch battery is, believe it or not, it is actually really bad at engaging targets that are too close. The guns can only depress so much, meaning that once something gets within a given distance, your 16-inch battery is useless and now you're relying on the 5-inch battery, which can engage surface targets almost basically right up next to the ship. And of course, if things really went bad, then you've got the 20 and 40 millimeters in the World War II era or the Sea Whiz in the modern era. But that's what the five inch turrets look like. Again, the ship would have had 10 of these as built. She's got six of them today. A couple of them are still active. They function as saluting batteries nowadays, but they do actually still come to life every once in a while. And for a nominal donation of, I believe when I last checked, it was $500, you too can fire a five inch 38 aboard USS New Jersey. And speaking of getting to fire some guns. Here we go, five. Four, three, two, one, fire! Obviously, I didn't get to fire the gun, but in 2022, during my previous visit to New Jersey, I did get to observe the starboard saluting battery being fired. This is something that you can do for the nominal donation of $50, so a little bit more affordable for most of us Battleship fans. Maybe I'll do this someday, but ah, it doesn't really appeal to me other than to be able to say I fired a gun on a Battleship. Meh. Depends on what you want to do, I suppose. This, though, is an original feature of the ship. This is the 40mm saluting battery. There is one here starboard, and then there's an equivalent one on the port side. Old nautical tradition holds that a warship should empty its guns when entering a port if it does not have any malintent. This evolved into the practice of gun salutes, still practiced today via saluting batteries on ships such as this. 
leaving the 538 and the saluting battery behind, heading back to the fan tail here, just adjacent to turret number three. This is where you end up at the end of your day when you want to conclude your tour and leave the USS New Jersey behind, and that is what we will be doing shortly. However, there is one more area on the ship that we do need to see, probably the most important part of the ship in terms of engineering spaces and just overall logistics. There is an area on the ship called Broadway. It is on third deck in the heart of the armored citadel. Remember, that is the structural core of the ship as well as the most heavily fortified area of the ship. Broadway is the longest contiguous straight run corridor anywhere on the ship in the interior portion of the hull. And it is off Broadway where you have basically all of your engineering spaces, your magazine spaces, your access to the barbettes, at least for turrets two and three, as well as, believe it or not, some navigational spaces. Broadway is one of those places on New Jersey that really does drive home the point of I'm on a battleship because, again, you have a wonderful blending of old and new all coming together in the same space because coming off of Broadway, you have boiler rooms and you have engine rooms that are all original to the 1940s but you also have magazine spaces that have been adapted to handle all sorts of different techniques in terms of regulations required to keep things safe, PPE, all sorts of notices about danger. Don't touch that. Don't look at that. That might cause death in some other place, you know? So all sorts of contact between history and more contemporary things, as well as being able to see the engineering plant of a ship like this. It is definitely a unique place to be. Let's go there now. So heading back inside the ship, down to third deck inside the armored citadel, what are you confronted with? Well, this is the site that you will find when you come across Broadway for the first time. We are forward looking aft. This is the longest contiguous run through the hull anywhere on the ship and here you can really get a sense of that as you look down through the passageway. You see all of the bulkheads with the joiner doors through the bulkheads. They just go on and on and on forever and ever. It is quite a long way down this corridor and for good reason because access to all of the engineering spaces and many of the magazine spaces, particularly those for the secondary battery comes off of Broadway. Also in the overhead, you will see that we've got that yellow I-beam. That is part of a transport system for transporting anything you want, in particular 16-inch shells from forward and after magazines between each other. That door, though, that you walk through to get onto Broadway, it is this behemoth. This is a watertight door, obviously, but it's an automatic one. It will seal and lock itself automatically whenever it closes. So you can see all of the clockwork mechanism in there actuating the dogs on all of the sides of the door. That is why, and this is the doorway that you go through to access Broadway from the forward end of the ship. However, if you look through the adjacent doorway, you will see a rather familiar looking site by this point. Remember the armored conning tower on the 04 level and you have the control console with your helm as well as engine order telegraphs? You've got exactly the same console right there. But we're on third deck, we're deep within the hull. What's all that about? Well, it's about Central Station. This is the third conning position on an Iowa-class battleship, namely the Iowa-class battleships Iowa and New Jersey. Missouri and Wisconsin do not have this con position. That was deleted in the idea that if you were ever in a position where you were going to need Central Station to be your primary helm, you were in some serious trouble, most likely already sinking, so by the time that you're actually going to be in need of Central Station, this conning position inside the Armored Citadel with absolutely no view to the outside world whatsoever, you've got bigger problems, so it was deemed as unnecessary. However, 
Those ships do retain the other three conning positions on the 04 level of the conning tower, the 08 level of the superstructure, and after steering, which is in an armored box around the rudder post as well, where you could directly control the rudders if you absolutely had to do it that way. But Central Station was something on the early Iowas. Remember, New Jersey is just the second of the type built, but not there on the subsequent ships. However, this is quite a nerve center for obviously command and control of the ship in terms of navigation, but also this cylindrical structure that you see here. This is the stable vertical. This is the ship's master gyro compass. This is an extremely important bit of technology because it is this device that is going to, first of all, tell you what direction you're pointed, but also via gyroscopic stabilization, it knows what vertical is, meaning that the signals from this gyro compass are then sent to various repeaters around the ship for navigational purposes, but also for fire control purposes. When those guns, particularly the main battery guns, but also the secondary battery gets in on this action too, when those guns are trained out on a target that is many miles away, remember, your target is moving, but you're also moving in three dimensions. The sea is never calm, meaning that there's always going to be some sort of motion being induced in your ship, whether it's pitch, roll, yaw, or a combination of all three, plus your own forward momentum through the water. The ship is only going to be perfectly vertical for very short times in whichever period of oscillation it's going through in either direction. This gyro knows what true vertical is, and because of that, it will, on the automatic mode for particularly main battery plot, if main battery plot has the guns to fire in automatic mode, meaning when all the guns that are selected are ready to fire, they're all loaded and buttoned up, the gyro compass will send a signal to main battery plot when the fire key is pressed in the plotting room and it will close the firing circuit only when the ship is perfectly vertical. This means that you have the best possible aim and the best possible chance of being accurate with your salvos and it's all driven by this gyro compass right here in Central Station. Arguably, it is the most important piece of equipment on the ship apart from the crew themselves. Continuing to walk aft on Broadway now, though this is on the port side wall, you will find a number of gauges and valve actuator handles all over the uh, side of Broadway here, particularly on the port side. Remember when we were in crew mess and we were looking at that sounding hatch? Well, those are tanks that are full of fluid of some type, be it water or fuel. This is where you control those tanks. All of these valves are linked up to some tank, some place deep within the ship, and these valves will enable the passage of fluids in and out of those tanks, between tanks, overboard discharges, and things like that. So these valves and knowing what they do is absolutely critical to operating this ship sustainably long term. It also did cross my mind that there is a non-zero chance that if I were to pull one of these valves, particularly the wrong one, there is a possibility that I could sink the USS New Jersey. Now, I would hope that the museum has disconnected all of the control linkages between these handles and the valves that they actuate if the Navy themselves didn't do that when they put the ship to sleep for the last time. However, it did occur to me that it's probably best not to touch these things because I don't know what I'm doing and if I can conceive of there being a non-zero chance of something catastrophic like that happening, then there's probably a non-zero chance of something catastrophic like that happening. So I decided to look and not touch, which is breaking my rules of touching things but probably it's for the best. However, that's just some of what you will see along the wall on the port side of Broadway. Also branching off of Broadway are numerous passageways, some of which will lead you farther into the ship toward amidships. This passageway in particular leads to one of the five inch magazines. I've been through here before, but it was closed off in 2023 when I went, so interesting. If I remember correctly, a white phosphorus magazine is off of this passageway as well for the five inch guns. However, Broadway predominantly is about engineering and this is the entrance to one of the unrestored fire rooms aboard USS New Jersey. Fire room, boiler room are synonymous terms. 
Not all of these spaces have been restored, and none of them are just directly open to the public. We did manage to get into one of the boiler rooms and one of the engine rooms. However, there are little informal tour groups that form up off of Broadway about every 20 to 30 minutes or so, and they will take you down into the engine rooms. But you do not go into these spaces unescorted because, number one, there are some things in there that if you do know what you're doing, you can open up direct access to the sea and it would be bad. And number two, there are no decks in here anymore. Every level that you're on becomes a platform, and they are not necessarily the sturdiest things in the world. There are a multitude of ways to kill yourself in a battleship engine room, so I understand why they only want guided tours in these particular engineering spaces. But you can get in there. It is no extra cost of admission. Just wait around until somebody comes along and asks you if you want to go into an engine room and say yes, please. Otherwise, looking down from third deck down into the engineering spaces, you can just see a glimpse of one of the gearbox casings. And these gearboxes, we'll see one of them up close a little bit later, on, but these are the gearboxes that run the propeller shafts. The turbine engines are generating all of the torque from the 550 to 600 psi dry steam coming into the turbines. The turbines are spinning up, but the turbines spin far too fast to power the propeller shafts directly. They also don't put out quite enough torque to do so. So they go through colossal amounts of reduction gearing in these gearboxes, which then are connected to the propeller shafts. Remember, Four fire rooms on an Iowa, four engine rooms on an Iowa, four main engines, four gearboxes, and four propeller shafts driving four propellers out the back. So it is a little bit of an elegant and intricate power plant. However, it was a tried and true design by this point. They did it for reliability, and it worked all the way through World War II and up into the 1990s. So they did something right. And basically, this overall scheme of power plant still used on many U.S. warships today, including nuclear-powered ones. They don't exactly tell you precisely how they work, but all you're doing with a nuclear-powered ship is substituting oil-fired boilers for a nuclear reactor. Otherwise, you're still generating steam and turning turbines and most likely running through gearboxes much like these. So after waiting around for about 10 to 15 minutes or so on Broadway, there are very few places to sit on this ship, so I just parked on the floor for a little while. I've been walking around for a few hours by this point and going up and down several ladders over several decks, so I appreciated the brief respite. However, eventually, a docent came around and asked, hey, do you want to go in an engine room? And of course, I said, yes, please. And here we are. Here we are looking at a combination of the main turbine casings as well as condenser casings for the power plant. So in other words, all of the boiler feed water that has been converted into steam, run through the turbines, and then sent back to be recycled. It's going to condense back into boiler feed water, and it's happening in some of this hardware here. Additionally, someplace in this mess of piping is the turbine itself that is running off of that high pressure steam. And then the turbine via a shaft is driving the gearboxes, which will then take all of the RPM from the turbine, reduce it, convert RPM into torque, and then send that torque down the propeller shafts to drive the ship through the water. I didn't really take all that many pictures down in the boiler or engine room, mostly because it was basically a guided tour at this point, and I wanted to show some respect to the docent who was doing her best. She was giving us her memorized spiel, and she was very enthusiastic. I appreciated that. I did catch a little snippet of uh, part of her lecture when she was talking about the boilers, and she was passing around one of the fuel injector rails for us to take a look at that you would shove into the boiler, and then that would be lit up. All of your pressurized fuel, be it Bunker C or Marine Diesel, going through this injector rail is sent into the fire, and that's basically how you change the ship's speed. You change the injection density of the fuel. More fuel means more power, and more power means more speed, and that's what it was. I am intentionally cutting off her head in my photography here because she did not explicitly consent to be filmed or photographed, so I was respecting her privacy even though she was at work and we didn't have any restrictions in terms of anything that we could or could not photograph, but I just don't like to do that to people. So you will hear her voice, partially, and you will partially see most of her body, but you will not see her face. So that's why. Okay, guys, right here, this would be Dalston. Do it well. Okay, 
take the USS New Jersey Zippo lighter, that would have been for sale at the gift shop, light that up, slide, slide in that red hole, open your fuel, open your air, your pop, and your burner is on. Now, once these are on, they basically would leave these on. Um, you only would have one of the eight down at a time for maintenance because you don't want everything to cool down completely. If this ship cooled down completely, it could take up to 48 hours for it to properly heat back up. So, leave these on so that you can leave with the drop of the hat if you need to. Now, like I said, this is for your fuel, this is for your air, this is your fuel injector right here. Originally, this ship was running on something called Bunker C, no. um, which is a very thick and gritty type of fuel. That was for the first three commissions, and then when the ship got its big overhaul in the 1980s, well, I had to cut off there because, well, she was going to hand me the injector rail next. It's heavier than you would expect, but then again, it makes sense because it's going to be in a raging inferno for maybe weeks at a time. However, to finish her point on what happened in the 1980s, when the Iowas were reactivated for service in the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean in the 1980s and early 90s, they were all still burning Bunker C, and Bunker C, if you remember from when we were in crew mess talking about the sounding hatch, it's a very viscous, very poorly refined form of crude oil that you just pumped it onto the ship and burned it. It was so viscous that it needed to be preheated before you could burn it because it just wouldn't flow out of the tanks. It was basically a non-Newtonian fluid at room temperature. You needed to heat that up to about 150 to 200 Fahrenheit before it would even be workable as a fluid. So that's interesting in and of itself. Makes you wonder what it must have been like to work in those tanks and, and in these engineering spaces in the World War II era. However, in the 1980s, there was a complete overhaul of the power plant on all of the Iowas. It's all the same original hardware that the ships were built with. The same boilers, the same gearboxes, the same turbines. However, the fuel source was changed from Bunker C to Marine Diesel. So this required a retooling and retuning of most of the fuel handling systems because now it doesn't have to handle fuel at high temperature. Now it can just pump the fuel around at room temperature. So a lot of the steam heat radiators and things that would have been running through the fuel tanks were deactivated because they were no longer needed. But also the entire engineering plant from a combustion perspective needed to be retuned and reorganized because the diesel obviously has different combustion characteristics to the bunker C, meaning that you won't be able to get maximum performance out of your power plant if you simply switch over from bunker C to burning diesel without making any sort of adjustments whatsoever. You're going to get inefficiencies, you're going to get incomplete combustion, and ultimately you're going to lose performance. So it took an awfully long time for the engineering teams, first on New Jersey, and then later on on Iowa coming back next, and then of course Missouri and Wisconsin followed. Wisconsin, the last of the Iowas to be reactivated. It took them a long time to figure out how to tune the plant so that you could get the most out of the fuel, but also so that you could maintain efficiency in terms of not burning too much fuel too quickly, not putting out too much smoke, because again, smoke was a concern back in the World War II era as well as in the 80s when these ships were back, to the point where there are periscopes in the engine room overlooking the tops of the funnel so that you could see the color of your smoke. If it's too dark, you might as well broadcast your position to the enemy. So lots of thinking went into how to tune the fuel air mixture and how to make sure that when the engines are demanding more load from the boilers, when you ramp up the amount of fuel that you're injecting, how does that change with the stoichiometric ratio, with the air intake, and all of that kind of thing. So there was a lot of thought and a lot of testing that went into making these ships more tenable to operate in the 1980s, but they really managed, and it was in the 1980s that the ultimate speed record for the Iowa-class battleships was set. New Jersey likes to claim that she has the record of being the fastest battleship in history, of being able to hit about 35 knots. However, there are some other sources that claim that other ships, particularly Iowa, actually exceeded that speed, being able to reach maybe as high as 37 knots for a brief period during a full power run. This comes from Captain Larry Sequist, who was commanding officer of Iowa in the 1980s. You may have seen an interview with him with the great naval historian Drakinefell, also here on YouTube. He claims that Iowa hit 37 knots. Was he exaggerating? Maybe a little bit. 
However, I think it's totally possible because these ships had beautiful hull designs, very hydrodynamically efficient, and of course, the power plants driving four shafts at 212,000 combined horsepower, all things are possible even with a ship which by the time the 80s rolled around at full load is displacing over 57,000 tons. What you're seeing here in this image, this is the turbine casing for number four main engine. This is not the turbine itself, but this is the gearbox attached to the back of the turbine. You will see in the lower part of the image, at the lower part of the casing, you see these two round structures with handles and padlocks on them. Those are your access hatches to get in there and service the gear reduction box. Physically, the gears are behind those covers. They have padlocks on them because when the ship was in service, and even still today, this is an incredibly sensitive piece of equipment. First of all, it means that if something happens to this gearbox, you're going to lose the number four main engine, so you're losing 25% of your propulsion. However, if any sort of debris falls into this gearbox casing, the gears are finished to such fine tolerances that if you drop a coin, if you drop even a piece of fabric in there, you run the risk of chewing up all of the gears in there and rendering the entire plant unusable. When maintenance needed to be conducted on these ships when they were in service, no work would happen inside these gearbox casings without armed Marine Corps guard present and without whoever was responsible for going inside these casings basically stripping out of all of their clothes and just putting on a onesie because they could not run the risk of having any debris fall in there. Any tools were signed in and out and that was verified by armed guard because anything left in there could literally destroy the ship, render it pretty much inoperable. And that remains true today. The museum recently found the keys to those padlocks, so they can open the gearbox casing if they want. However, because it is still such sensitive equipment built to such insane tolerances, and because if there were any permanent damage done to any significant part of the engineering plan on this ship, it would require having to rip the ship open to get any of these large components out and because, although it is an incredibly slim chance, but there is still a non-zero chance of this ship or any of the other Iowas being recalled into service once again in the case of extreme emergency, all of these systems need to remain preserved and pristine just as the Navy left them. So you will never see the inside of this gearbox casing on your own. However, the museum has shown pictures of the inside of this particular gearbox casing on a couple of YouTube videos just to demonstrate what's in there, but then they seal it up again and they will probably never open it again because, well, it is so sensitive. Leaving the very bottom of the ship, when you're in the engine room, you are actually below the waterline even today, and it's surprisingly hot down there. I'd expected it to be a bit cooler because there's obviously no engine room activity going on these days, but still pretty hot down there. However, Eventually, you come back up to the main deck on the fantail where, like all good things, your tour of the USS New Jersey eventually comes to an end. The tour route, there are three different paths that you can take along the self-guided tour. You have seen selections from all of them here today. Uh, however, the overall tour route is almost two miles long and it traverses three decks within the hull plus down into the engineering spaces if you wish to go there, as well as five levels of the superstructure. So there's a lot of climbing and there's a lot of walking involved. However, everything is decently well accessible. I will say that if anybody has any particular mobility concerns, unfortunately, most areas on the ship are not going to be accessible to you because it's a historic structure, and therefore the law says it's grandfathered in with being uh, ADA compliant in most places. Any museum alterations to the ship do have to be ADA compliant. However, most of the ship remains as she was as last active in the 1980s. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to get around, but 
you most of the time will have very little issue, although some of the ladders are a bit on the steeper side. So just be careful and mind your head no matter where you go. However, here, leaving the ship now on the Fantail, just adjacent to turret three on the starboard side. Remember, we got on the ship via the main deck on the Foxhole all the way up forward. But here we go, leaving the battleship. A very nice day aboard. And I've got to say, once again, incredibly impressed by everything that the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial do to preserve this ship and to present her as well as they do present her because this is an enormous ship as she sits here today, about 45,000 tons, 887 feet long, 108 feet wide. She's big. She's a huge space and... She's all steel for the most part, so always you're going to be dealing with corrosion, always you're going to be dealing with water ingress in places where you shouldn't have water ingress, and of course you're always going to have to pay bills as well. All of the mess of cabling going in to power the ship today, it cost the museum $10,000 per day to keep this battleship afloat on the Delaware River just as she is now as a mostly inert object. Imagine how expensive it is to run this ship. That's why you needed government funding to do it when they were commissioned. But as the ship continues to get older, that $10,000 a day will soon turn into maybe $20,000 or $30,000 or $40,000 a day. So organizations like the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial, they do need our support. And of course, they greatly appreciate it when they do get it. Very pleased to announce, though, that before I took this latest tour of the battleship, and only a couple of weeks before, it was announced that the New Jersey State Legislature had appropriated $5 million in funding for the battleship, particularly earmarked to bring her into dry dock at some point in early 2024. Tentatively, as of the time of recording this, the museum have floated a date of early February. However, nothing is set in stone yet. No contracts have been signed to my knowledge, so... We will see an Iowa underway again, albeit as a dead ship tow, on the Delaware River at some point in 2024 in all likelihood. However, for now, she remains at the Camden Dockyard where she has been since October 2001 when the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial opened to the public. She stands here today as a testament to human genius written in steel over eight decades. The USS New Jersey has embodied the American fighting spirit as well as the spirit of human innovation. She is the pinnacle of American shipbuilding. She is the most decorated surviving U.S. warship, and she stands today still as an inspiration to all those who have any interest in history and to all those who have a heartfelt appreciation for the service and sacrifice of those far greater than I to answer the call of their nation in times of peril. Until next time, I do thank you all very, very much for watching, if indeed you are still watching. Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much, and of course, we will see you soon.